meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 Response. Agenda item one is the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 7th of April. Members are asked to note the minutes which I have agreed. Members should also note that the minutes of evidence from that meeting have been published in the official report available on the committee's web page. Agenda item two is the revised seating plan. The revised seating plan is included in members' packs at page nine. This revised layout takes account of feedback received from members following Tuesday's meeting and better facilitates social distancing. I ask members to note the plan and to please try to abide by it. I would also ask members that when they are entering and exiting the chamber, they would do so via the closest doors to their seat, whether that be the main doors, via the lobbies, or the doors by the officials' boxes. This approach will also help to uphold social distancing in the chamber. Agenda item three is a statement from the Minister for Education. The Speaker. Surround sound. I hear the Finance Minister. <laughs> yes. The Speaker received notification on the 7th of April that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to make is included in your pack at page 11. I'd like to welcome the Minister of Education to this meeting of the Committee. I invite the Minister to make a statement which should be heard by members without interruption. Following the statement, there will then be an opportunity for members to ask questions. I call the Minister for Education, Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Principal Spe Speaker, and I thank you for the opportunity to update the Ad Hoc Committee on the work that has been undertaken and is currently underway in the education sector in response to the current COVID-19 situation. In opening, may I say I am grateful to all those who work in early years, in schools, in the youth and wider educational sectors for their vital contribution at this very difficult time. The issues we are facing have never been encountered before, and all areas of society face, challenges, face difficult challenges. As ever, the physical and mental health and well-being uh, of the young people in our care and all our staff must be our priority. Our teachers and school leaders are doing an excellent job in supporting our, current, uh, our children and young people and providing remote learning that is maintaining a sense of daily routine. In particular, I want to thank those schools which are open today for key workers, uh, children and vulnerable children, and those that intend to open over Easter and in the weeks ahead. In these extraordinary times, it is heartening that our principals and staff are showing such leadership and compassion for vulnerable pupils and those parents uh, who are key to the COVID-19 response. I am sure members will wish to join me in uh, paying tribute to teaching and non-teaching staff, uh, their trade union representatives and the increasing number of volunteers now coming forward, be they school governors, retired teachers, retired classroom assistants or colleagues from the wider educational sector. I am deeply grateful to them for the wholehearted, uh, constructive and cooperative manner in which they have lent their support to the wider effort to respond to the enormous challenges posed by the COVID-19 outbreak. Before I go into detail on the Department's response to COVID-19, uh, I would highlight uh, that a formal offer on teachers' pay and workload was made yesterday to the five main teaching unions. I am pleased to say there has been progress on the issues of teachers' pay and workload. Since returning to the Executive in January, uh, I have made a uh, resolution of this long-running industrial dispute a priority. Uh, indeed, this is one of the main commitments made in the new decade, new approach. I am grateful to executive colleagues for the overall decisions on the budget allocation to the Department of Education. This has allowed me to ensure that appropriate financial provision for a pay award has been included in my decisions on the allocations within the Department of Education's 2021 budget. The five trade unions uh, which make up the Northern Ireland Teaching Council uh, will now consult with their members on the proposals in advance of any formal acceptance. Uh, and I would urge all teachers to consider the formal offer, which, uh, if accepted, will bring an end to the current industrial action, uh, which has been ongoing since January 2017 uh, and which has been, had a, debil a debilitating effect on the sector. Turning to um, the COVID-19 situation, the Department's COVID-19 strategy and plan supports the overall executive strategy. Our plan is built around, upon the, around the following uh, strategic priorities. Firstly, to ensure the continuity of learning for children and young people. 
secondly, to support vulnerable children and the children of key workers, and thirdly, to ensure families do not experience hardship as a result of schools closing. Our central planning assumption is that schools and non-statutory preschool education settings will remain open to accommodate remote learning and to ensure that there is provision for vulnerable children and for key workers' children up to the end of year 10. The vast majority of children should not attend school. The Department will follow the Public uh, Health uh, Agency advice at all times and will make sure the use of COVID-19 legislation and regulations uh, making powers only where necessary. My Department has put in place uh, emergency response arrangements and is close, working closely with all its educational partners on a range of very complex issues arising from the coronavirus uh, outbreak, including the Education Authority on service delivery issues, the Council for the Curriculum uh, Education and, and Assessment on examination issues, and working on a daily basis with the teachers' unions. Schools are regularly updated with appropriate advice uh, as the situation evolves. These arrangements support the wider executive response to COVID-19. Uh, in the Department, we have focused our work on six priority areas, which I'll be uh, touching upon. Uh, firstly, pay for both the teaching and non-teaching workforce, free school meals, support for vulnerable children, distance learning, examination, and support for key workers. May I say that in all these areas, we're attempting to address problems that have never uh, been before encountered. encountered. Uh, we've been putting in place measures that we've never had to implement before, certainly not on this scale, and we're having to do all this at great speed with no opportunities to properly consult or properly to test. It's really a question of uh, deliver quickly, assess impact on the ground and refine as we go. Uh, and all this with the workforce that has been impacted at an organisational level and at a personal level like everyone else in society by the issues that this terrible crisis has visited upon us. They have risen magnificently to the challenge. Turning to each of the elements in turn, firstly on pay for the teaching and non-teaching workforce, I can confirm that the education sector employees will continue to receive normal pay over the period of the COVID-19 crisis. Normal pay applies regardless of whether people are quarantined, medically advised to self-isolate, unable to work due to caring responsibilities, or unable to attend their workplace due to closure. The same arrangements apply to substitute teachers and non-teaching staff providing emergency cover for any periods uh, they have been engaged to work. All current bookings through the Northern Ireland Substitute Teacher Register will be honoured. Absences will not count towards the normal triggers for the absence, uh, absence management or contractual sick pay and will not constitute a break in service for pensions or for other purposes. We are currently putting in place a contingency arrangement to ensure that the payrolls will be processed and payments made. Now, I recognise that some workers in education, such as the substitute teaching workforce, who provide a day-to-day -day cover, will no longer have access to secure work. Uh, therefore, proposals have been developed uh, for a hardship fund for those substitute teachers who are providing day-to-day -day cover in recent months, but whose regular work has now ended as a result of COVID-19. There is a separate bid that has been made to the Department of Finance to access the funding for this. Uh, but I would say that this funding will be dependent upon obtaining additional funding. Turning to the second issue of free school meals, uh, to address concerns about the impact that school closures will have on children uh, uh, that are eligible for free school meals, a new direct uh, payment scheme has been introduced for families whose children are eligible for a free school meal. From the 23rd of March, uh, eligible families are receiving £2.70 uh, per child per day for each day of term that schools are closed. This is paid fortnightly. And to avoid any further hardship payment, that is continuing over the Easter period uh, for all the days, uh, all the, the normal school days that would have, or the 10 days that would normally have, have occurred over the Easter period. To date, over 51,000 direct payments have been made uh, to families in respect of uh, 93,000 children. And by the 15th of, of April, over 96,000 uh, children, uh, their families will have received payments. Now, we are aware of a number of children who have not received direct payments because there's no bank account details have been made available to the Education Authority. The EA is working hard to obtain the bank uh, details, and I would urge anyone, everyone whose children receive free school meals to get the details to the Education Authority as soon as possible. 
We also know that uh, there are a number of children whose families have no bank accounts at all, and that includes 360 children uh, of asylum seekers. Uh, and we're working with the Home Office to resolve uh, this issue urgently. The Department for Communities has announced a number of additional measures to support provision of food and assistance to vulnerable groups. And we're working closely uh, with the Department to ensure food is available to those families. Uh, as part of the Voluntary and Community Sector Response um, Programme, coordinated DFC and agreed by the Executive, the Youth Service will engage alongside councils to assess, assist in the provision of uh, food for vulnerable young people. Uh, and indeed, the funding for that was agreed yesterday at the Executive announced by the Finance Minister earlier on. A youth online website allows um, young people to register a food need. Going forward, their role is expected to involve provision of food for over 3,000 vulnerable young people who remain at risk despite the free school meal direct payments. And I'm grateful for the proactivity of the youth service have demonstrated in response to COVID-19 to date and know that they will have a vital contribution to uh, make working alongside other partners at local level. As in the rest of the UK, I'm prioritising support for vulnerable children and their parents and carers. I appreciate that school is a protective factor for many vulnerable children, and for some, it offers the only stability in their lives. Vulnerable children should therefore be facilitated to attend schools where it is in their best interests and safe and appropriate to do so. Schools, parents, uh, carers, and social services, where children have a social worker, should work closely together on determining the safest option for each child and the Education Authority has a range of services in place to provide support for vulnerable children and their parents. Uh, my department continues to engage with colleagues in the health and social care sector to ensure that there is a continuum of support for these families, including those children uh, on or on the cusp of the Child Protection Register, as particular pressures could materialise if they are at home for significant periods. We are also developing further guidance to support vulnerable children including those attending uh, special schools, and anticipate that this will be published shortly. The EA and health authorities have provided assurances that provisions are in place to meet the education and care needs of special uh, school children. Where schools have closed the building to pupils, a range of creative approaches are in use, with a range of online learning platforms being used to maintain uh, contact and engage directly with children. Protocols remain in place between schools in health and social care keeping all of the needs of children at the forefront of decision-making. Uh, as our children and young people have more free time, it is only natural that they will spend more time online. We want to make sure that teachers, parents and carers have all the knowledge and advice that they need to keep children safe online. I will be announcing further measures to help them in the coming days. The Department has published guidance on its website in relation to social distancing, and personal protection uh, equipment, PPE, in education settings. Currently, NHS guidelines is that where staff and children are not uh, symptomatic, then no PPE is required over and above normal good hygiene practices. Further, further guidance is being developed in Great Britain on the use of PPE in education sectors, uh, including in relation to children and young people with complex needs. The equivalent Northern Ireland guidance will be published once it has been cleared by the Public Health Agency. That said, the EA has received a supply of PPE and cleaning materials, which is available to all schools, including special schools, on request. And there, is, there has been, uh, in a number of occasions, there has been delivery of that uh, equipment. It should be noted that, in the main, parents of special school children have decided to keep their children at home. Where key workers are parents of vulnerable children who normally attend a special school, or indeed any school, wish to send their, their, ch their children to school, they should, in first instance, discuss this with the school, who will determine if they can accommodate uh, that request. In terms of distance learning, in the current context, distance learning is clearly vitally important to support uh, continuity of learning and also provide a sense of purpose and daily routine for our children and young people. My department, together with the Council for uh, the Curriculum Examinations and Assessment, uh, the Education Authority, ETI and CCMS is focused on ensuring that appropriate action is taken as far as possible, learning, progression and well-being of our children and young people. Our delivery partners have identified uh, designated link officers who are the first point of contact for the schools. These officers are working with schools, and indeed every school has uh, a point of contact, to provide pastoral and practical support to ensure that individual issues are resolved uh, promptly 
and to identify where more can be done to provide sports, uh, supply provision for continuity of learning. Expertise in the EA, CCA and ETI is being used to ensure curriculum resources are available when and where is needed. And indeed, there's been also additional offers of help from outside those bodies. Schools have been proactive in supporting home learning, and teachers have devised booklets to guide parents how to use learning platforms. Uh, substantial capacity and provision exists within the uh, education network service to support learning and teaching outside the classroom. We are also seeing some very positive statistics. Uh, on Friday, the 3rd of April, almost 45,000 individual students and teachers accessed the EA education network portal from home. In excess of 80,000 visits to the EA uh, education network portal were made from home over a 24-hour period. And over 720,000 emails were sent and received by students and teachers within that 24-hour period. Turning now to qualifications and examinations, I recognise that exams are a key concern for children and parents. In the absence of exams this summer, my priority is, is to ensure that pupils can move on as planned to the next stage of their lives, be it starting university, further education, uh, sixth form, or apprenticeship, or employment. It's crucial that no one is disadvantaged. So my officials have been working closely with CCEA and colleagues across the UK to develop appropriate arrangements that are robust as well as fair. I want to ensure that we maintain alignment uh, with arrangements in England and Wales as far as possible to ensure that learners are not disadvantaged, particularly in, in relation to admission to university. However, I need to take in, into account policy differences between the different jurisdictions and take the decisions that ultimately are right for the young people in Northern Ireland. CCEA has uh, produced uh, detailed advice to the department on a range of options, and there's been assessment by my officials of these uh, and consulting with key stakeholders, including representatives of, of head teachers and teaching unions. I expect to be in a position to make key decisions very soon and will announce these as soon as possible. Once I've taken those decisions, CCEA will be instructed to implement them as a matter of urgency. There will be a significant amount of detailed work required, including work to develop an appropriate appeals process and arrangements uh, for private uh, candidates. CCEA is developing detailed guidance for schools. This will be finalised and issued as soon as decisions are taken. My department is also working closely with the Department for the Economy to ensure that those taking vocational qualifications are not disadvantaged by the cancellation uh, of scheduled exams and assessments, and there was, uh, the Economy Minister made reference to that yesterday. Members will be aware that the Executive have asked parents to keep children at home wherever possible, and ask schools to remain open only for those children who absolutely need to attend. The education sector has been asked to uh, deploy its resources as part of a wider national, indeed global effort, to keep vital services functioning for the greater good. Schools are not open for normal business. Schools and uh, preschool settings should be open where safe to do so, as per PHA guideline, uh, guidance, to provide supervised learning for those children who are vulnerable uh, or whose parents' work is vital for the functioning of essential services, i.e. key workers. This is a very last resort, and children should, uh, should not come to school if alternative arrangements can be made. In recent weeks, uh, approximately between 750 and 1,400 vulnerable children uh, and children of key workers have attended around 400 to 500 schools. I should say that, that uh, those figures are the individual figures for a particular day, and so the, the global number of children will actually be higher than that because many parents um, will, for example, have maybe arrangements for two or three days but want to have their children in, so the figure uh, can be a little bit misleading. Um, and those key workers have attended four to 500 schools for supervised learning, education or educational supervision. In these schools, around about 750 teaching staff have been on site, along with around about 600 non-teaching staff. On a daily basis, we are gathering data from schools and the wider education sector on the key issues, including the number of schools that are open and the, numbers, uh, and the number of pupils at schools. Uh, so far, uptake uh, of the scheme has been relatively low, consistent with the pattern elsewhere uh, in uh, in Great Britain. This would suggest that parents are keeping their, their children at home where it is possible. This could change in the coming weeks due to predicted surge, but it will depend upon parental choices. Mechanisms are in place to capture the information needed to allow the department and the managing authorities to refine, adjust 
and replan is necessary in light of this ever-changing uh, situation. If a school leader considers it unsafe to open because they do not have the staff available, it should not be open or should limit the number of pupils permitted accordingly. In addition to this, our schools have been working on a collaborative cluster arrangements and work continues to bed this in on the ground. The Department has been working closely with the EA and other education partners to assign a link officer to every school or cluster to ensure that sufficient provision exists to care for vulnerable children and the children of our key critical workers, and this system again is bedding in well. The EA have a helpline for key workers and a registration scheme whereby key workers uh, who are having trouble uh, getting a placement for their children um, can request additional help to have their children placed. The numbers unplaced is, has decreased in a matter of days from 271 to the latest figures 131 is continuing to come down. And we're confident that these children will soon be placed uh, soon. An increasing number of school leaders are coming to the fore to establish cluster arrangements with immediate effect, supported by EA teaching staff and volunteers to ensure that they have sufficient provision for the children who need it. Uh, and the department, EA and other education partners continue to work closely and support this leadership on the ground in the coming days and weeks ahead. I would like to place on record my thanks to the educational leaders in our community who are playing their part to support vulnerable children and children of key workers by opening their schools and working collaboratively with, uh, with other schools at this unprecedented times. We are all in this together and we simply could not do it without this leadership. Members may also be aware that on the 27th of March, I announced a volunteering scheme to assist in the response to COVID-19. The aim of this scheme is to give extra support to teachers and other school staff to carry out the various duties that supervision of children uh, require, and they've been ready to be deployed in the event that it becomes necessary. Early figures for the, um, the volunteer scheme are encouraging. As of today, 1,088 people have applied to be a volunteer with so far 882 of those people have already been cleared by Access NI, and we are continuing to process applications. The scheme operates alongside the clustering measures that the Department and others are developing. Finally, in relation to childcare, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to inform members that along with my colleague uh, Robin Swan, the Minister for Health, we have published a joint, statement, a joint announcement today which sets out the arrangements that we will be putting in place to provide childcare for vulnerable children and the children of key workers across Northern Ireland. We have secured a significant funding package from the Executive of £12 million, which helps to address a number of key issues for childcare provision in response to the COVID-19, namely the need to ensure that registered childcare providers, including childminders who are providing childcare for a reduced number of vulnerable children and those of key workers during limited operating arrangements, uh, can do so without risking the sustainability of their provision. Ensure that key workers and parents of vulnerable children can access childcare places and do not experience financial hardship as a result of needing longer hours for childcare or incurring higher costs for the bespoke uh, approved home, uh, home childcare scheme. Ensure that uh, registered childcare daycare providers and childminders uh, who need to operate longer hours or holiday cover or evening provision are supported to do so. The package of emergency measures also seeks to address the issue of sectoral sustainability by developing a support measure for registered settings that have closed. I think we all need to realise that whenever we come out of this, we need to ensure that there is a, a childcare sector uh, that is in place after this. This measure will interact with financial insist, uh, assistance measures announced by the Chancellor and administered by the Department of Economy. Uh, and uh, with child care, which childcare settings and childminders may be able to avail of. More detail of this package uh, of support measures will be made available, uh, but essentially we aim to provide uh, a bespoke approved home childcare scheme aimed at enabling key workers to have their childcare needs met in their own homes, enhanced support for uh, registered childminders who provide childcare for key workers and vulnerable children, Support for registered daycare centres to remain open for, for key workers and vulnerable children in locations uh, where key workers need them most and for those settings which have been forced to close. Childcare advice and guidance for parents who are key workers, including a helpline. Advice and guidance for registered uh, settings and providers. I, I hope the measures that, I have, that we have announced today will provide much needed reassurance to parents of vulnerable children 
and those who are key workers uh, that a range of approved and registered childcare operations are available and importantly that the uh, additional costs keeping uh, key aspects of provision operational during this time will not be simply passed on to them. Parents who need it will not be required to pay anything additional in terms of childcare costs during this period which may rise from the approved ch home childcare care scheme. Uh, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, these measures do not change the uh, starting position which we have adopted, which is, where possible, children should be cared for in their own homes. Schools, preschool, education settings, registered daycare facilities and child minders should only be providing, be providing care for the children of key workers and vulnerable children. It is essential that we work together uh, across the education and health sectors to ensure that vulnerable children and those of key frontline staff can access safe and responsible uh, provision. These new measures will sit alongside the support being provided by schools and preschool education settings for the children of key workers and vulnerable children. I know that childcare is a key demand, a key issue for uh, many parents. It becomes even more critical for key workers, and we need to support them in the fight against the coronavirus. I hope members agree that the package of measures Robin and Swan and myself have announced today will go some way towards uh, helping key workers access a wide range of childcare provision and also help protect and sustain the childcare sector so it is in a position to remain open uh, and for some reopen when the COVID-19 crisis ends. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it's difficult to overestimate the challenges that our society as a whole is facing as a consequence of the COVID-19 outbreak. Our lives, family and work are being influenced and impacted every day in ways that we could never have imagined a few weeks ago. The position of COVID-19 is exceptionally fast moving, and I've made it my priority to bring as much clarity as possible, as quickly as possible, on the full range of very complex issues that we face. My department is working hard to support the education sector in the fight against the virus. In the months ahead, the department will continue to have a crucial role to play, not just in relation to the pressure felt by the education sector, but also the related health, economic and social issues felt by our society. I'm sure that by continuing to work closely together, we can make a very significant contribution to the overall effort to address and defeat this threat to the well-being of our society. I thank the Minister for making his statement. <clears throat> I will now invite members to ask questions. I will allow a period for around one hour for this. It's my intention to allow as many members as possible who wish to ask a question to do so. However, as per Tuesday, this depends on members asking focused and succinct questions. Members may ask one question only, and it must be related to the statement that has just been presented by the Minister for Education. The Chair of the Education Committee, Mr Little, will be allowed some latitude. He can, answer, he can ask two questions of the Minister. I call the Chair of the Education Committee, Mr Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you for your service uh, at this difficult time. Thank the Education Minister for his statement and for the democratic accountability it affords this Assembly, which is more important than ever. Can I also thank the teaching and non-teaching staff across Northern Ireland for their courageous and innovative leadership during this emergency? School leaders have established their own guidance and approaches, and many of our schools are fabricating essential PPE to protect our community. We thank them for that, and we welcome the formal offer to hopefully deliver the long overdue fair teacher pay and conditions settlement. I can also thank the children and young people in our community that are staying at home to protect the NHS and keep us safe. The Education Minister's guidance to schools is to close other than to children of key workers and vulnerable children. That includes children with a statement of special educational need. Principal Deputy Speaker, all special school pupils have a statement of special educational need. That's around 6,000 children across Northern Ireland and I think up to 30 schools. The Education uh, Minister will be aware in those settings there is particular close contact on a one-to-one -one basis. So can I ask the Minister when he has met with special school leaders, what arrangements he has put in place to provide PPE testing and medical provision available for special schools to open, what arrangements are in place for that to be provided remotely uh, when pupils are at home and what action he has taken uh, for the reopening of those special schools in due course. I appreciate that um, uh, 
uh, my mathematics sort of may suggest that's a little bit more than two questions, but I'll try, I'll try and cover that as, as sort of uh, as one main question in relation to it. Look, we're in constant contact uh, with uh, special schools. Uh, the member is right in terms of the impact and vulnerable children. It's not simply defined as anybody who's a statement. It, it, it is sort of in a wider context than that. And obviously, as part of this, uh, there is a particular issue around um, those who are particularly medically vulnerable and those that aren't. Because again, sometimes the two can be, uh, and I appreciate the member is not in any way conflating them. Uh, we're in constant contact with the uh, uh, special schools, uh, each individual one, and also uh, the helpful suggestions I think the chair has, has made in terms of the direct contact with some of the groups. What we are finding, first of all, is that in the vast bulk of cases, the most parents, even if there is a level of medical vulnerability, have expressed a desire that they want to look after their child directly at home. So, for instance, uh, many of the schools are not uh, open at present. We're trying to facilitate uh, where there is opening. But, for instance, we've been told, I think, by 23 of the special schools uh, that they've had no request from any parent to be open. And so, therefore, it is about accommodating where there is that, that need. In terms of PPE, uh, specifically, uh, as indicated, uh, there will be response to where there is requests in terms of, of PPE. Um, I think it mentioned at the committee and had given, I'm trying to find the, the details. Uh, as part of the, the overall PPE process of procurement, um, while the focus has clearly been on the health service and the health workers, uh, through the Department of Finance and Central Procurement Division, there has been a small stock of, of PPE that has been held back for requests from other government agencies, other government departments. Uh, as a result, uh, there has been a wide range of stock that has been in, uh, obtained, most of that on the, the level which will also relate to hygiene. Um, that has meant uh, that, in terms of that, and obviously stock is, is, is constantly getting renewed, um, and as such, there have been a wide range of deliveries. So, for instance, in terms of if you include all elements of stock, um, there has been, I think, 580 uh, schools that, to which there has been some level of delivery within that. Um, so, while there is a, a remaining current stock that, that is there on things such as aprons, such as face shields, um, there has been a, a amount of that has been delivered. And that has been tried to facilitate it where it's needed, where it's necessary, and where it's been uh, requested. And that remains the, the position uh, of that. While perhaps individual employees within special schools have raised the issue about PPE, I don't think we've had a direct uh, request that has, from a school saying we are closed because of the lack of PPE. But we will be happy to, working with the EA, to accommodate that where possible. Again, in terms of reopening, there is a, a wider context uh, which the executive will have to face uh, in terms of when it is safe and appropriate to open schools. Um, that, and indeed, a wide range of things. That is something that will constantly be kept under review. There are no plans at this stage to uh, reopen in the immediate future. And I think it's important that we do get on top of, of this virus at a time whenever there's a level of, of surge. Uh, and obviously then we will tailor any of responses which involve also the, the wider school sector uh, as time, time moves on. It, it will be a movable uh, situation. Call Mr William Humphrey. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his comprehensive statement to the House this afternoon. Minister, I'm sure you'll agree with me and join me in congratulating the North Belfast principals who a number of weeks ago gathered together some PPE and delivered it down to the Matter Hospital to deliver for those NHS staff working in the front line in that hospital. Would you also join with me in commending the principal of St Malachy School in North Belfast, Dr McBride, and his governors and senior management team for making the school available for the use of those same workers in the matter as they continue to fight this wretched disease. Can I ask the Minister and thank him for all that he has done and Mr Baker, his Permanent Secretary, and their team. In the weeks to come, as we reach the peak, can I ask the Minister if he would outline what further uh, developments could be put in place to assist key workers, to some of whom may have had difficulty getting their children into school, to assist them to get their children in place at school? Uh, first of all, I would, I would like to commend those schools you mentioned about uh, St Malachy's. I understand I think a similar position is now. I think Methodist College is now doing this as well. And what has also been the case, he's mentioned about the North Belfast schools. There are a wide range, and I, I probably don't want to name other individual schools because I'm sure I'll, I'll forget some of them. But one of the things that has been very apparent has been the number of schools which, beyond simply the role that they have played in education or support for key workers, have provided... Um, 
and I've looked and seen this, particularly because there would be more potential availability in the post-primary sector. Uh, they've, they've looked in terms of what they have in terms of stock and resources, uh, and where they have found face masks, aprons, have been, um, been providing those. And I've, I've seen that across all sectors. I've seen it in all parts of Northern Ireland, and I completely commend the, the work that's, that's, that's going on. In terms of, broadly speaking, the key workers as we move ahead, uh, part of this is the helpful development of clusters to try to make sure uh, that there are individual opportunities for every key worker. Uh, we saw a situation, and the pattern, it's interesting that the pattern has been very similar in different jurisdictions, uh, that on day one, there was a certain number of, of pupils came. It reduced sort of fairly significantly within uh, a number of days, but has remained either, either fairly level or actually gone up at times since then. It is quite plausible that we could see a, a greater level of, of peak. So I think the clusters have a role to play. Those are not forced on schools, and there will be a number of schools that will want to do individual uh, provision within that. Um, it is also the case, uh, because we've not had to draw down, given the numbers that have been there, we've not had to draw down, particularly on volunteers, but uh, the fact that we have uh, over 1,000 people who have volunteered, nearly 900 of them have been cleared so far, does mean that, that we have um, a ready sort of group of people uh, who, if particularly if there are gaps within particular geographical areas, can step up to the plate. Because the best way in terms of being able to provide that assistance is probably through rotation of, state, of, of staff. And where possible, I think most of the schools that have been open have been on the basis of those that are coming in, uh, they'll be on a rota basis so that it will only be once every number of days. It's not been the, the case with every school, but uh, a large number of those schools. So uh, the data that we're driving through this, and there is a lot of work being done by officials on a daily basis to collect that, that data, um, has been sort of been very useful. The helpline, indeed, the contact with um, EA has been uh, very useful. And the numbers of unplaced children is coming down day by day. In some cases, to be fair, some of those referrals go beyond what any school could accommodate because sometimes key workers will make a request to say, well, I'm in work until 8 o'clock tonight or 10 o'clock at night. And generally speaking, it would be very difficult for any school to accommodate um, some of those people. But the important thing is that when we reach the surge, uh, that we are not seeing sort of a, a, a key worker denied that opportunity. And I've been taken by at times a number of schools where they're staying open, where perhaps in terms of their local school community, there's maybe only one child, maybe one or two key workers that are being facilitated. But that school has felt it'd be absolutely worthwhile still to be open for that. And every contribution that every school is making is making a difference. And we don't know where that one individual could make the difference between somebody's life and somebody's death. We are nine minutes 40 in, and we've had two questions. So just as I asked members to keep their questions streamlined, could I gently remind my good friend, the minister, if he could do the same, that would be appreciated, I'm sure. I call the deputy chair of the committee, Ms. Karen Mullen. At last can caller. Minister, I want to thank you for your statement um, and the work that yourself and your department has done uh, to date during this period. I particularly welcome the ongoing work of the department and the teachers' union, unions um, to bring a proposal uh, on the teachers' industrial actions, so thank you for that. Minister, according to your department, there is 60,000 children being educated through remote onla online learning. That's under 20% of the school-going population. In Derry, I've been working with the post-primary schools to provide laptops to young people who wouldn't have, have one in their home. Um, Minister, are you concerned at the level of online learning that has taken place? And will your department look at providing laptops and connectivity support to those who need it? If there's any lack of resources, I'm sure that, that can be worked through. I, I think at times we get particular figures. They can be a, a snapshot of a particular moment in time. I mentioned, for instance, that uh, on a 24-hour period, in terms of the online learning, there was something like 720,000 emails went back and forward within that. So there's a considerable amount of doing that. There's also a number of schools have faced, obviously, in certain geographical areas of Northern Ireland where there is particular problems with broadband, and a lot of schools have made provisions in terms of um, sort of packs. So it's not all just simply online learning as well. A lot of that is obviously particularly focused on the post-primary. Uh, if there's anything else that, that can be done, and uh, I should say as well to the um, uh, the principal deputy speaker, I'll be 
doing sort of lines afterwards. I must, I must not take too long in an answer. I'll write that out a thousand times for the, uh, for the Deputy Speaker. I call Mr Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I think, uh, as I raise, I too would like to pay tribute and huge appreciation to our teachers, our teaching workforce, our principals, classroom assistants, people who are uh, in schools uh, helping uh, uh, with uh, the children of uh, our key workers in the health service at this very critical time. And also, Minister, to put on record my appreciation and thanks to you, particularly during these challenging times. I know uh, it's extremely busy and challenging for you, and I have to say you've been more than accessible, uh, entirely open, uh, in fact, an open door policy, I would feel, and uh, very easy to get answers from, and I appreciate that, and I want to put that on the record. I'd li like to follow William Humphrey in terms of St Malachy's, uh, and I think that uh, it's a very uh, important announcement by them, and shows great leadership of the school to uh, re enter into that voluntary arrangement with the local hospital. Uh, and I'm just wondering, Minister, and I know you've received correspondence from me in relation to this, uh, has there been any consideration given to the wider school estate, given that there are schools in every uh, town and village are very accessible for, the, for testing, given that we are going to be ramping up testing, also in terms of treatment and even step-down services, or any form of use by uh, the Department of Health uh, that, that would be appreciated during these times? Thank the member. Um, I think it is important that the, the public sector as a whole pulls together. The, the member is right in terms of the availability of, of um, facilities. Uh, from that point of view, while there can be direct arrangements made maybe at, at a local level, uh, in many ways, Schools remain uh, as a public asset. I am more than happy to accommodate anything that is requested. I think the driver on that has got to come from the Department of Health at a, at a central level. Uh, and my general assessment uh, of things, and the Health Minister will obviously speak for himself, in terms of some of the challenges out there, at the moment it is not particularly being driven by lack of space. Uh, there was a specific case, for instance, in Somalikis, where particularly, for instance, they were used in terms of showering facilities that were approximate to a school, and I think that was extremely helpful. Um, but largely speaking around testing, there's been work that's gone on, I think, for instance, in terms of some of the, uh, the MOT centres. If, if there's a location that is needed uh, upon request from the Department of Health of the Minister, I'd be more than happy to make that, that available. Call Mr Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And, and like the rest of the members, I would like to commend you for the service you've given as the Minister of Education and indeed the Permanent Secretary. At this stage, I, I, I would echo Daniel's words in, the, in that there has been an open-door approach, and I think that has, has, has worked better for democracy and in terms of these unprecedented times. And I want to also thank you for your relentless pursuit of praise for those key workers who are our teachers and teaching staff and support staff and the incredible job that they're doing at this time. And, and just one further thing to that, uh, in my own town, Wallace High School, and Mr Monteith in particular, have done a tremendous amount of work uh, creating visors uh, for PPE for, for frontline workers, and I'm sure you would, you would want to thank them for that, as the whole assembly will. Um, Minister, there is ongoing work, as you've alluded to, with regard to CCEA and the other uh, uh, exam boards. Um, and I understand, having spoken to you a number of times on this in committee, that there are ongoing uh, and protracted and, and diligent work uh, to ensure it's as fair as possible. But I'm increasingly coming across examples where uh, we have households where there are two key workers, perhaps working 14-hour shifts, uh, both parents, and they're maybe working three, four, five shifts a week. And uh, I just want to, to, to have reassurance from yourself that the children from those houses, uh, through perhaps a lack of parental um, help at this time, and at a key point in their education, uh, will not be disadvantaged in any awarding uh, of marks, uh, especially with uh, GCSE and A-level exams. Yeah, will be, um, as part of that, I said, there's detailed proposals which I think are effectively ready at this stage. Um, I suppose to update members this week, in particular in terms of the, the point that that reached, there were then discussions held with, with uh, important sort of stakeholders, be it the trade unions, be it the likes of CCMS, the EA, and other organisations. Uh, I think that has identified it identified probably a little bit of fine tuning, but broadly speaking, um, suggested that that would be the case. I think one of the other slight restrictions has been that that we want to make sure that while there's got to be something that's absolutely fit for purpose in Northern Ireland. We've also got to make sure it's compatible with, with you know, wider opportunities, both in the UK and also to ensure that it doesn't uh, clash with, with anything in the Republic of Ireland or beyond as well. 
uh, I hope to bring that to a conclusion very quickly. That, that will, as indicated, not be on the basis of, and indeed I, I suspect there would be more direct damage had there been, um, for example, if we were doing exams next month where some of that late study had been disrupted. But the fact that this will be through a mechanism, whenever it's revealed, of a mixture of um, presumed grades, uh, coursework assessment, should mean that, that, uh, that, if you like, something done almost in the teeth of the result will have very little impact in relation to that. But it, it's also the case that, that um, as part of the overall package, there will need to be examination, and indeed, as part of that reveal, is what appeal mechanism is there as well. Uh, let me put it this way. I suspect uh, for all of us who have stood for election at times, um, we may at, at various times have felt we did not necessarily get the result that, uh, that we merited. Um, there is not necessarily an appeal mechanism within, within politics in that, in that regard, but you know, that will need to be taken account as, uh, of as well. And I think there will be, I think as a lot of aspects of society, you know, even what has been the short-term impact, will then, there will be ripples as, as we move ahead um, in relation to that. Uh, I suppose the only thing is, at least, it's not been something that has been very geographically centred. So this is something which applies not just in Northern Ireland, but really throughout, throughout the world. So it's about how we, as broadly speaking, as a society, cope with that. Yeah, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, can I thank the Minister for coming to the committee uh, this afternoon. Um, I just want to put on record one comment uh, that a principal, one of the largest schools in my own constituency, um, sent to me. and. Uh, I think it is worth just putting on the record in terms of what other members have said about this education minister coming here, uh, engaging, being accessible as he has been with me, and personal phone calls, and very quickly to respond. But the principal of this school said that on behalf of my school community, I am emailing to thank you for your exemplary leadership at this unprecedented time in education. He went on to say that you are leading from the front, and communication has been transparent, regular, and informative. Uh, and then I, I am immensely proud of my own school as we continue to support the pupils of parents who are key workers and we are fully staffed for the first week of the Easter holiday. I think it is important that we put on record not just political appreciation to this minister but also from those principals uh, who do admire the work that the uh, minister has had to undertake in these very difficult uh, and challenging times. Minister, members have raised the issue, uh, the deputy chair of the committee uh, about uh, online schooling, uh, accessibility issues, and there are schools that are very much tooled up with online delivery. Wallace High School, Pond Park, two schools that my children go to, uh, every day regularly emailing uh, my children, online assessments, feedback. But not every school has that same online accessibility, and not every home has it. Uh, and so there are examples of schools that can effectively deliver. But there are also constituents contacting me concerned that there isn't sufficient engagement and they aren't getting the support that they feel that they need to provide the homeschooling that is necessary. So, Minister, what more can schools be doing to provide that support? And also over the Easter break, confirmation that schools will continue to provide that kind of assistance? Well, schools are continuing to provide that. I mean, I'm, I'm always maybe slightly worried whenever I hear praise because you just wonder what disasters are around the corner. Uh, I'm sure we've all. Uh, been there. Uh, look, from that point of view, the, uh, I suppose we do have the advantage in Northern Ireland with the C2K system, which does enable, for the most part, uh, that level of, of, of delivery. Now, that will not be to every home, it will not be in every area. And as I said, a number of schools are then providing uh, material. We are working, I think, with schools as well to see are there additional learning materials that, that are required uh, within that. Uh, I, I guess that, that not every school is at just the same level of being able to provide those. Uh, and where there is help that can be provided, we will be happy to, to uh, step up to the, the mark. He mentions about the Easter uh, situation. I mean, one of the things which I have to say I was uh, delighted to see was that initially we had a, uh, quite a large number of schools that were open. Um, now, as some schools found, and a number of schools, they found that there were no uh, children of key parents coming needed the school. Some have closed. But the concern was that whenever we reached the Easter period, um, as it's outside the normal term time, there would be a large drop off of schools. That, that hasn't happened. We're maintaining around about 400 schools being open. Uh, and indeed, the extent to which schools then have, have stepped up to the mark to be able to provide that level of service, I think, is an exemplar to our society. And part of, you know, sometimes we can see levels of negativity within the news. We can see people breaching social distancing. 
uh, abusing the system. But what I would say in the school system is very much at the forefront of this. Uh, we have seen throughout this crisis people stepping up to provide the best they possibly can. And I think I'm proud to say uh, that within our education system that has happened as well. Call Ms Catherine Kelly. Uh, like other members, Minister, I welcome the positive news in your statement today. The Finance, Finance Minister announced a funding package for emergency childcare provision this afternoon. What role will the Department of Education play in this initiative, and when do you believe the new package will be in place to cater for the flexibility required by many key workers that has been lacking to date? Uh, in terms of this is obviously while it's been announced in relation to DE. We've been working very closely with the Department of Health um, on this issue. Um, from that perspective, yes, there's been a particular problem, I think, with childcare, and particularly childcare settings, because um, the economies of scale for childcare providers have meant that, it, in many cases, it's simply not been practical for them to be open, whatever their, their willingness. A school can open with a small number of staff to accommodate a small number of children, and that, in many ways, is... is relatively straightforward, um, but for a childcare setting, a lot of whom are uh, private um, organisations, uh, to be able to do that and sustain that is, is simply financially not viable, uh, plus indeed if they were getting the volume of, of children, there would be issues around the social distancing side of it as well. Um, in terms of that, the, the detail has been worked through um, with uh, Department of Health. They have been doing a trawl through their HR of those who will uh, need this or require it, be working through uh, Department of Health and their trusts, and indeed particularly the early learning um, section of the Department of, of Health. Uh, so I suspect that what we will see is that uh, in terms of the elements of this, it, it coming on stream at different, uh, different uh, stages. So we're talking about, for example, in terms of the largest volume will be through, we're looking maybe 75 uh, childcare settings. Um, and there will be some that are ready to go straight away. Some will take slightly longer. Some of those will be settings that will be reopening that have been held. And I should also uh, place on record as well my thanks that, that in terms of the number of schools out there, there were some schools that whenever uh, this initially kicked off were not in a position to be open, but have actually worked hard to reopen. So you know, the, the traffic, if you like, has gone both, both ways. In terms of the detail of the scheme on the practicalities, uh, the work that will be going, for instance, on the one hand with identifying uh, the requests and the, the need with the, a particular childcare setting or indeed through the other aspects of this scheme. The work will largely be speaking be driven by the Department of Health and the Trusts. Uh, the Department stands by working closely alongside them to assist them in, in that task, but they will probably be taking the direct lead on that in terms of the, the practical implementation of that. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And to begin with, could I also put on record my thanks to the Minister uh, for coming here before the Assembly today, his accessibility and indeed the leadership that he has demonstrated in what is a difficult time for all. Much has been said in tribute to teachers and teaching staff, and I, I concur with that. They have done a, an excellent job in, in difficult circumstances. But I would also like to pre place on record, and I am sure the Minister would, our sincere thanks to many parents who have stepped up to the teaching role within our homes. Uh, they have done so with, uh, with uh, immediate pressures, whether that be in terms of um, a loss of a job or indeed trying to hold down a job and not send children to schools, as the advice has uh, suggested, where there is alternatives for uh, childcare. Many have been distressed in relation to grades, and I welcome the Minister's statement, which outlines a way hopefully forward with that in the coming days. Um, AQA examinations, the questions around will they be postponed, or indeed uh, how results for GCSE and A-levels will be calculated at the outcome, as many parents realise that a mock examination is not essentially always uh, an outcome as to um, what the reality can be. But in relation to childcare, can the Minister outline is there any plans to introduce emergency schools into areas of Northern Ireland where childcare provision has been lacking to date? Principally, uh just to deal with a couple of the points in relation to that. Yes, look, we hope there will be greater clarity in exams. Uh, I mean, the broad outline of where we are has been sketched out uh, previously. Um, the detail of that, I want to be in a position that can be announced fully as a package in CCA, then we'd be ready directly to write out to schools and to parents. Um, there has been a, gr a good deal of work ongoing to ensure that uh, things are, broadly speaking, aligned. That's probably particularly important for A-level students. 
because, um, and indeed I took part uh, yesterday evening in a conference call with the, um, the education ministers of the, the four jurisdictions within the United Kingdom. Uh, and one of the things that was made very clear, and I think will be, is that, for example, when A-level results are announced, that they're able to be announced, I know Scotland's in a slightly different position, but certainly between England, England Wales and Northern Ireland, on the same day at the same time, that, that is critical uh, to that. Uh, there's got to be a little bit of a measure balance between ensuring that, uh, on the one hand, we keep dates as close as to what they would normally be, but also balancing that against the, um, the issue of um, universities will face a particular difficulty um, this year, and obviously there will need to be a bit of time given for them to prepare. In terms of emergency schools, we have scoped out a range of, range of options. Uh, what we are finding is, uh, first of all, I suppose maybe the expected uh, drop-off that would have happened during Easter hasn't really happened. Uh, that means that current arrangements are probably working better than maybe could have been anticipated. Secondly, we're seeing a range of schools uh, either formally or informally clustering. Uh, we are asking where schools are coming together, and this can be in groups of two, groups of four or five, that whenever they're doing that to register with the department, and the first few of those are starting to appear. In other occasions, uh, we have found a situation in which, for example, two local schools have simply come together. They may have not made a formal arrangement, but uh, arranged that side of it as well. That seems to be operating as a driver to provide um, assistance for key worker children who do not, who are, are would potentially going to school that's closed. And one of the, well, the numbers are still not particularly large. Um, we started off with a, with a situation where there was a minimal amount of, of children going to a school that was not was not their own. Steadily, that that number is it's growing. Uh, but where we have is a. a a final fallback position, because we, I think the feeling is that, that the cluster side of it, as it develops, will actually work and provide the solution. But there is also a fallback that the EA, uh, if, if in a particular area, it is clear that schools are simply not open and they cannot accommodate those level of, of, of key worker children, they have, there is an opportunity for them effectively to, to open up a school uh, with a range of local staff and uh, volunteers and be able to provide that, that safety net. But we've not reached that point. And uh, with the success, in, in many ways, of the clusters starting to, to kick in, I suspect it may be a step that we don't have to take uh, on that basis. But it has been something that has been scoped ahead as a possibility, if, if needed. Question here, Dennis. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, and I want to thank the Minister for his time here today. It's, it's very much appreciated. And I concur with what uh, the remarks from Jonathan Buckley, and I want to send solidarity to the parents as well who are, who are homeschooling um, children at this time. As a parent who's currently doing that myself, I can tell you it's not easy, very frustrating at times. Um, but due to the, the support um, from, from our schools, and particularly uh, my own child's school, Bun School and Your. Um, I want to thank, place my thanks to, to the teachers from that school as well for their support. Um, I'm glad to hear in the Minister in his statement, um, and other members have alluded to it as well, that um, there will be a, ro a robust um, appeals mechanism um, in, in, uh, uh, in terms of the predicted grades process. I think that's very important, and I think uh, students need reassurance of that at, at this time. Um, but I want to ask the Minister, um, given the prevalence of cross-border study, um, has there been any contact between the uh, Departments of Education North and South in relation to the admissions process um, and whether the various options being pursued on both sides of the border will have any uh, adverse impact um, on students from the North accessing further hi higher education in the South or, uh, and vice versa? We've got to create a situation which is seamless for everybody on that basis. Obviously, in terms of the direct contact on admissions, uh, obviously the principal driver, because possibly uniquely um, the Department of Education here will operate up to basically the end of secondary level, so that a lot of the work directly with the universities will have happened through the Department of the Economy. But there is ongoing contact, and I think we're confident that uh, there will not be barriers placed north-south or south-north in the same way as there won't be barriers placed east-west. And I think there's a recognition um, from the point of view of, of universities across um, a wide range of areas. And indeed, I think there's also been acceptance, even on a, on a sort of pan-European basis, that there will be acceptance of, of grades. Uh, I think people realise the very difficult and challenging circumstances that are there, uh, and so there are those, those ongoing discussions um, across a wide range of jurisdictions, 
and I would be confident uh, that you know, can't say that there, there won't be some sort of teething problem somewhere down the line, or a particular pupil that is left in some level of difficulties. But I, I in general, I'd be confident that, that arrangements will be in place uh, to ensure that that smooth transition um, across different jurisdictions will be able to happen. Can I associate myself with the member's remarks, speaking as the key stage two coordinator for our dining room? Uh, it's very much I very much appreciate teachers in this weather. Uh, can I call Mr. Justin McNulty? Gurma Yogurt, Lars Cam Corla. Um, I want to place on record my appreciation and admiration for our teachers, principals, and support staff for their versatility and for their commitment to playing a very important role in de defeating COVID-19. The form of the education system has been entirely reconstituted, and teachers have pro proven their worth in our communities and in our society. I also want to pay tribute to parents and pupils in the same manner for the, the responsibility they've all taken in defeating COVID-19. I'm sure the Minister can reassure this House that grades awarded for A-levels will be recognised by universities across this island and across Europe and across the world. On a more um, important issue for me personally, I feel it's, I'm acutely aware that the enforced lockdown is confining some children to a 24-7 unsafe and frightening environment. Before COVID-19, school was a safe haven for those children, and now there is no escape. The Minister spoke about children who are on the cusp or on the Child Protection Register. Can the Minister give this House a reassurance that no child will be unsafe at home as an outcome of the enforced lockdown from COVID-19? Thank you. Well, I can, I can certainly give the assurance that every, every possible action will be done to try to protect that. Uh, you know, I, I think the concern that all of us have, and it's something that's shared and whenever I was speaking last night to other education ministers, there, there is a concern and nervousness out there in every jurisdiction. And it's not just, if you like, with children who are on particular registers or particular positions as to what difficulties will actually occur from perhaps families that we don't know um, where there is a problem, where indeed there may not have been much of a problem beforehand, but this will exacerbate some sort of situation. Every effort will be done to try to protect children um, I mentioned we'll be working in the days to come, particularly on safeguarding issues online. We're working closely, particularly with, uh, with social services, with health, to try to make sure, and indeed a range of services that are available through EA to children will continue and indeed be tailored for that. Uh, but there's also the case, and indeed it's one of the reasons why when we're looking, when there's been an examination of the availability of, of school places, that it wasn't just the key workers, it was also vulnerable children who would, who would benefit from being in, in, in school. Uh, and that's why that has been a cohort of those that, that have been in. Uh, but it is also the case that, that while people may appear uh, on, in particular circumstances, particular registers, that we also avail of, of the local knowledge within that. And, and therefore, yesterday, for instance, I had written out to all schools saying, uh, and I know from talking to some of the schools, this is something they've been doing already, is where you have particular concerns uh, with particular children, you need to bring those forward uh, and indeed reach out to those children. You need to uh, contact and make that information available to social services. And indeed, in terms of one of the key link points, I mentioned that, that each school, uh, there's a range of, of link officers that will be there through the Education Authority. Um, and they will be the point, a sort of a conduit as well, sometimes within schools, but it's, it's about schools looking simply beyond, here's some, a list of, of names on a list. They will apply a certain level of particular knowledge to that, and I'm encouraging schools to do that as well. Uh, can I be confident that no child will be unsafe? Sadly, I, I don't think I've been in a position to give that, that guarantee. In the same way as I, we all fear there will be terrible domestic incidents that will happen, um, through, I, I suppose, evil actions, because I, I was about to say as a result of this, because ultimately if somebody commits, be it either domestic crime or a crime against a child, whatever pressures are there, that should not, never be an excuse for perpetrating that. 
Sadly, while we try and keep that um, and try and avoid it where possible, uh, I think we're sadly we will see some incidents uh, that are going to happen. So I can't give a guarantee that no, that no child will be, uh, will be unsafe throughout this. But every conceivable effort will be made to try to protect our children uh, as time moves on. Call Ms Paula Bradley. Deputy Speaker, and can I join members in thanking the Minister um, for the work that he's been doing in, in, in these very worrying times, and thank you for many of the measures you've put in place. Can I join also members uh, in the House in thanking all of the, the teaching family, and we know it's more than teachers that allow for those gates to be opened in every morning, and also those childminders um, that are out there doing a wonderful job. And I'm, I'm glad to note from your statement too um, the, the, the protections going forward for uh, those uh, childcare facilities in the future, because we know this is going to end someday, and we want to be able to for the, the, our, our children to be able to avail of those childcare facilities. And we know you have responsibility also for the childcare strategy. But going back to the statement, Minister, um, you talked about clustering, and I think if I heard you right, you'd said that it was a voluntary um, uh, model. Um, could you maybe expand a bit on that and how many clusters there are up and running at the moment? Well, we have, um, in terms of the latest information, I suppose. Those who have directly registered we were at least of about 14 uh, direct clusters involving, I think, about 56 schools. Uh, but that won't include also where there's been, and we're encouraging those that have made arrangements then to notify the, uh, the school. It is, it is preferable while there are uh, link officers from the EA and they will help facilitate, and some schools will want help and facilitation. Others will say we're very happy to do this on our own. Um, you know, for example, that list doesn't include. I had spoken to a school principal um, last week who said, well, really, from day one, they were a girls' school, fairly adjacent to uh, a boys' school and uh, post-primary, uh, and indeed many, quite often, of, of siblings, if you like, went to both. So the one school was effectively accommodating uh, both sets of children. That wouldn't be, if you like, a formal cluster, but is there within that. Why particularly I'm saying it's voluntary, I think, is twofold. Uh, first of all, um, well, the overriding aim is to ensure that there is somewhere where a child can be, can be placed and placed in a safe environment. Um, the most successful levels of clusters will happen where that is ha happening, maybe with facilitation, but essentially embryonically by agreement and by a voluntary basis on it. It is also the case, particularly within some primary schools, that many primary schools feel in a comfortable, and they, some post-primaries as well, they may have a minimal no number of children coming through their, their door. Uh, but it may well be that the, the level of reassurance that those parents feel is in a very small number coming through the door. Now, I, I should say, even in terms of the clustering, you know, we're talking about uh, the overall numbers. I don't think there's any school at any stage which has gone beyond about 30 pupils within its, its doors. In most cases, it would be below 20, or indeed, in most cases, in fact, are very, very low indeed. And you will find a situation that where a local school may well end up with three or four children each day coming in through the door. They have a couple of teachers that will be very familiar to those children. They may feel a lot more comfortable simply operating on their own. Support is available to them, so that if, for example, they feel under pressure because of staffing, they can be worked on either through the substitute list or indeed volunteers to provide that. But it's not being enforced on people. We're not saying, you as a school need to close to work with such and such school in, instead in relation to it. And I think that as an embryonic level seems to have been um, developing, and again, it's part of the thing because we're in a slightly unprecedented um, situation, where it is about actually trying to scope out what is the best bit and, and trying to adjust according to experience. Thank you, uh, and I welcome the minister's statement and, and the range of uh, answers he's given today, which is, is always useful in terms of even the public discourse that's going on out there. Um, I, I'm sure you, you'll recognise the very wise decision made a number of years ago to stick with AAS levels and modules during uh, GCSEs, etc. And we didn't follow Mr Gove down that rabbit hole at that time will benefit him in terms of reaching a decision as to how we move forward with exams. But the point I want to raise is, is in relation to the hardship fund for substitute teachers. And I welcome the fact that he uh, and the Department of Finance are exploring how that, that, that would roll out. Can I give any more detail at this time? Is there any light at the end of the tunnel uh, for those substitute teachers who find themselves in significant financial difficulties at this time? There are, uh, the members should have uh, raised a valid point. And, and I congratulate it. was probably the first exchange we've had without 
academic selection actually being mentioned uh, today. So, uh, so there is there is progress even in dark times. There there is progress uh, within that. Uh, no, can I say in, in relation to that we've scoped out uh, an option. Uh, there could be a range of options that could be pursued. Um, I should point out that in terms of substitute teachers, broadly speaking, uh, while it might be a slightly invisible line and people can move between the two, there are, I suppose, two categories effectively of substitute teachers. Those who um, are effectively doing with, that don't have a permanent post in the school but have a particular contract that is there. So it may well be that a substitute teacher is there for a term or two dealing, uh, filling in for a teacher who's either on maternity leave or a long-term illness. And where, um, where those teachers are in place and have had a contract, I think, you know, that is being honoured. Those, those, those teachers are being paid on the same basis as their permanent colleagues. He raises, I think, the issue um, which I think has been a major problem in terms of a large section of the substitute teacher population may be described as, as sort of uh, casual workers, at least in terms of their, their timings. They, they may be doing a day here, a couple of days somewhere else. Uh, that has been the problem because they're not direct employees, they're not self-employed, um, and even from that point of view, we find ourselves in a slightly different situation structurally from what is there, for instance, in England and Wales, because while a lot of those people are also casually, uh, the structures within England and Wales, for instance, have largely been on the basis of substitute teachers being supplied via, via agencies, so the agencies have had the opportunity to, to furlough uh, workers. So proposals have been put forward. I think, to be fair, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the finance minister, I think he's very sympathetic to the position that substitute teachers are put in. I think the problem we find ourselves at the moment is if we are to do the maximum we can for those substitute teachers, will require a considerable resource that's there. It isn't there in the education budget. Uh, it, it is, would be, I think, next to impossible to turn around to schools and say, effectively, you take a, a cut on what you're getting so that you can actually fund those who will not be providing a service for you. So it's, it's really got to come externally. And I think a range of options will be explored. I think the one problem that we have is given the somewhat unprecedented nature of the demands, um, the finance minister, to be fair, is dealing with a large range of bids across different departments. I think this would be relatively high priority. Uh, but what is there available in resources at the moment is not enough and has not been sufficient at present to meet all those demands. Now, we have seen, particularly in terms of some of the Barnett consequentials, it seems each week there is some further movement that happened. We saw last night, in, for instance, in terms of some money that will be available to charities. So I think that where we are today is not the end of the story. Uh, and we're looking as well if there's any imaginative solutions working alongside the finance minister as well. But I also have to put that caution that unless there's additional money brought in, it, it, is, it is difficult to see a solution unless there's something additional levered in. Certainly anything beyond that would be suboptimal. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking the Minister, although I am going to declare an interest and say as a mother of a year 13, there are a group of students, and this ties in with my question, that their mental health is being considered because year 11s and year 13s, as, as Mr O'Dowd has mentioned, don't know what's going to happen with them because they will be heading back to school. So I would, I would ask in your clarification that some thought is given to those pupils who are part way through GCSEs and part way through what should have been their ASs. But thinking about that mental health, um, the stress and the pressure, what I would like to ask you is how is the learning, medical and respite care that's normally accessed by pupils at special schools being provided to children and their families who are at home now? Um, you've said that many of those families are caring for those children at home. The breaks in the care can have significant difficulties for those children, especially with occupational therapy or speech language. Um, many principals feel that communication in the tone and substance has been somewhat lacking, and I'm just um, making sure that their voice is heard today, and if you could maybe give them some reassurance that they can pass to families about that support. In terms of that support, we're working obviously particularly on some of that as, as health related, so we're working with our health colleagues. The EA is doing a level of, of, of reach out. I think, for instance, uh, there has been contingency planning that has been implemented uh, on, for instance, mental health in terms of counselling sessions to ensure that that can continue on. Um, I think the, the individual circumstances, we're trying as much as possible in terms of interventions, working alongside health to make sure there are uh, bespoke interventions for the individuals um, within that. Uh, you know, I think at times in terms of where advice goes out, particularly to officials and sorry to schools, uh, there, also, there is always a difficult balance to be struck. 
on a number of fronts. First of all, um, if the, and there will be a certain level, and maybe it's, I'm not saying sometimes this isn't valid, but in terms of the work that's, that's ongoing, I'll make a couple of points. Sometimes in terms of the balance, some people will see particular advice as being too prescriptive, and the same advice can be interpreted by others as saying we actually want to be told more what to do, and now you'll get that simultaneously. Sometimes people will say um, you are spending too long getting a particular piece of advice out, and then others will complain that they haven't got it as yet. So it's, it's about striking that level of balance. I think where there is, uh, there is a very thoroughness in the level of advice that has been able to be provided, while as, at best as possible trying to give that flexibility to, uh, to schools, um, it is undoubtedly the case in where we are facing, and this is particularly true probably of the first few weeks of this, um, things that normally would have washed through the system, would have had consultation, either formally or informally, things that, that normally would have taken, and I know there's often criticism within, within uh, the body politic that, that it takes forever to turn particular things around or do particular things, but things that, that in terms of studied look at from the point of view of policy development or implementation that may under normal circumstances take uh, months or weeks or sometimes having to be done in days or hours. That means, therefore, that even in terms of any advice or guidance is not by its nature absolutely perfect. It is why uh, whenever we are putting out things, it, it sometimes is on the basis of the best possible estimate of, of what can be done. And why, um, I think I referred yesterday to something being work in progress, and that's not on the, the basis of the normal meaning of the sense of that, but meaning actually that, that there's, it's a process rather than a full stop. It's a comma, if you like, rather than a full stop. And consequently, there's a range of things which are still having to, to be ongoing. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I appreciate the, the time. And thank you, Minister, for your statement so far. I would like to also commend those teachers who are facilitating some schools to stay open for key children. Social distancing, as we're all aware, is very important and is the reason schools have been closed. This has caused massive disruption in most of the childcare and exam preparation. I support this action taken for to help to save lives. Will the Minister agree with me that reports of 200 people ignoring the social distancing regulations, which everybody is driving home day and daily, and gang for a funeral at Ulster are deeply concerning given the direction taken by every area of government. While some play at pretend soldiers and risk people in our community, in fact all the people in our community, the real soldiers are battling day and night in hospitals to save lives, not to cause life being ta lives to be taken. I think the Does member, the Minister support the, the member, children? The Member needs to return to the content of the Minister's statement, please. I will let the Speaker. Does the Minister support the call for children and young people to stay at home this Easter weekend and ignore actions of others? Well, look, I think this is a period when all of us outside society have got to be responsible. Uh, I have mentioned, I think, uh, earlier that in terms of the response to COVID violence, we have seen, I think, in a very positive way, it bringing out the best in people. I think from a range of things in terms of responses at times, it also sometimes brings out the worst. We see selfishness. We see uh, a level of approach to social distancing. We have, as I suppose, um, which is referenced in that, been able to provide further advice on social distancing. Broadly speaking, because the numbers that have come uh, to schools, because parents have been responsible, because parents have taken a view that, where possible, that child should be at home, social distancing has, generally speaking, then not been a particular problem uh, within schools. I think there was an initial worry, both here and in other places, whenever the initial decision was to try to keep schools uh, open on a partial basis for um, key workers and for vulnerable children, that schools would then be inundated with thousands of, of, of children coming in, and it would be very difficult to... And I think that was something that was not just felt here, but was shared in a wider, wider context. Uh, people have behaved responsibly and done that. And I, I think, for the most part as well, there have been very few people in the school system that have abused the system. He mentions about particularly as we move ahead, schools in terms of the, the Easter period. Uh, look, we're living in extraordinary times. There's been an extraordinary response to that. I think for all of us, um, I, we appreciate more than ever the things that we would normally take for granted and see as being normal. I think over the Easter weekend, traditionally, for many, many families, this has been seen as the last break before the summer term, before people have plunged into exams and that sort of things. There is 
Uh, quite often that has been used by people to go away somewhere, to spend a few days, to go to the seaside or whatever. Uh, what I would say is whatever the temptation to revert to being normal uh, in, over the Easter weekend to uh, take sort of to relax and effectively do things that you would normally do over Easter has got to be resisted by people. We are at a, a critical bit and all of us have a part to play because none of us know uh, where sort of we can be a, a passenger, if you like, for, uh, for this virus where we couldn't. It, it is critical, therefore, that whatever the, the conditions over Easter, the people remain at home uh, and they behave utterly responsibly. And I think that is particularly true for families, for children who will we want to see this as some sort of release valve from, from what's been there. It's critical that this is carried on until we, we get this virus beaten. Call Mr Mark Durkham. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister uh, for his statement, his department for their response to date uh, to this crisis, and indeed the response of the education sector as a whole that uh, other speakers have touched on. I'd particularly like to commend uh, the Minister on his collaboration with the Communities uh, Minister that has now seen the rollout of uh, money to pay for meals for children who would have been in receipt of free school meals. And, and we, we certainly hope that that's what that money is being spent on now. The Minister did refer, however, to the fact that there was a small percentage of, of pupils who weren't getting that access due to the fact that their parents don't have bank accounts. Could the Minister maybe elaborate a wee bit more on that and on the efforts that his department is making to make sure these extremely vulnerable, extremely poor children get the nourishment that they need? I think there's a number of responses to that and I thank the Minister, uh, for the member for his, his comments. Um, we were in a position, probably unlike other jurisdictions, that there's one of the advantages of perhaps the fact that Northern Ireland is not that large, and whereas in other jurisdictions they've had to work through local authorities, and there's great work being done in local authorities, but the fact actually we were able to provide a Northern Ireland-wide solution to things, in particular as regards to the, the issue of free school meals, because uh, for the vast majority, um, around about 95 per cent of the cohort that were on free school meals entitlement were also on uniform grant, we actually had the advantage pretty much from day one, that a large number of those were, were simply the, the bank account details were held by the Education Authority, we were able to pay those directly. Um, there was approximately at the start around about 4,000 uh, children who fell outside that and then appeals were made by the EA for people to get their bank account details uh, to the, the EA. That has been largely successful and additionally as there would be people who would be getting processed to come on to free school meals who, because of loss of jobs or coming on to universal credit, that has also been, been done. It leaves, I suppose, two particular groups which are attempting to be reduced uh, in number each day. Particularly, there's around about 500, um, we believe, that, that don't have bank accounts, and there is ongoing work between the EA and those individually to try to, to get people to set up bank accounts to do that. Um, there is a wider provision, I'll, I'll come to one final grip in a moment, there's a wider provision in terms of uh, again, maybe one of the less noticed parts of the funding package that was has been able to be announced today was around about 400,000 to youth service, who will then particularly try and target where there are vulnerable children in vulnerable circumstances, because it is also the case that unfortunately, while it is the most effective and efficient way of, of paying into bank accounts, that will not necessarily guarantee that every child is getting a, a proper meal. And so therefore there will need to be, I think, through the knowledge that is there through youth service to be able to support that. There is one other group which I think was alluded to in the, the statement of around about 360 asylum seekers. Uh, we've worked with Department of Communities, but particularly we're working now with uh, the Home Office. Uh, and I think a methodology, while they may not have a bank account, uh, in terms of um, their provisions, effectively more money can be effectively debited into um, I can't remember the, the name of the exact system, but essentially this was oh, sorry. Ah, yes, that's, that's the, the, so we're working with the Home Office so that those particularly Syrian refugees and others who would fall into that, that category will then provide, get that direct financial assistance as well. Um, so it, it's about drilling down on the numbers to actually make sure that, that we move from a position where at the start there were 97,000 children to be catered for and probably a growing number, that those who still require that additional help, we want to bring that down to zero. Call Ms Rachel Woods.
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'll keep this very brief and to the point. Perhaps you'll allow me a second question then. But uh, what provision will there be for children of key workers who attend fee-paying schools? I'm talking about the likes of the Steiner School. Can they be provide, provided support at local EA-funded school clusters? Uh, yes. I mean, from the point of view in terms of clusters, the idea is we want to reach a situation in which the clusters are effectively open to anybody in the local area. Um, and I don't want to see really a, a situation where a school, uh, if there's somebody genuinely coming to them saying, uh, and indeed that's where the EA are trying to help um, place people. If, if a school, for instance, is closed, uh, then and there's a process by which there's a helpline where that parent can get in touch with the EA, and that is starting to be successful in terms of saying, here is this particular child, uh, here's what is available in the area, and trying to liaise with that to ensure there's, there's placement for that. And uh, as I said, that has meant that while not very large numbers at the start, the numbers that are unplaced have gone down by more than 50% and are continuing to go down. Um, so the idea, indeed, the guidance from day one was that people should not be put off by way of, of sector. If there was a maintained school, uh, it should accommodate uh, people who were looking to go along from a controlled school, a local Irish medium school, an integrated school, or a private school, or whatever. So there is no, no barrier uh, to that. And indeed, private schools themselves, again, there's, there's no reason why they also shouldn't be uh, continuing that, that provision where they can. But if somebody is finding a particular local school that is closed, the aim is more and more to try to find an accommodation of, of, of a place for them. To be fair to many schools, a lot of them will be closed. Um, in part, particularly for very small schools, uh, that if there is some level of disruption to their staff, it makes it just completely un unfeasible for them to, to do that. Before I indulge the member and allow her to ask a second question, could I just point out gently, there are 17 people on my list to speak in this debate. The member was number 16 on the list. The reason why I shimmied other people along was to ensure that the member and Mr Carroll got called in the debate. Ask your second question. I really appreciate that. I just want to know what your position is on Northern Ireland universities being able to conduct admissions in a timely manner, given the UCAS moratorium ends on the 20th of April. Uh, I think they should do obviously the admissions process is a matter for the Department of the Economy, but we're working on a, on a UK-wide basis to provide solutions, and that's one of the reasons why, for instance, it's critical in terms of discussions that A-level results are published at an identical time so that universities can all operate uh, within that. Mr. Jerry Carroll. I want to ask the Minister about the situation facing uh, substitute teachers who are working off the register and classroom assistants who don't have a, a contract. Uh, it's concerning that they are still in limbo, not knowing whether they will get a, a pay packet going forward. And as he may know, uh, nearly one third of teachers don't have permanent contracts, which in itself is a damning indictment of the state of the education sector entering uh, this crisis. These are public sector workers. Uh, they provide a, a essential service. Many of them are still working from home. Um, so I want to ask him what plans does he have to guarantee their wages. I'm afraid the May Hardship Fund doesn't seem to be covering it. So I'd like to see what he's doing to ensure that those wages are covered. And just the, the note, I've written to him already about this issue, but uh, there's an issue with asylum seekers trying to get access to Wi-Fi services uh, at home. There's an issue around bank accounts. Uh, some of them not having bank accounts and a problem getting uh, payments for, for, for food um, on, on the free school meeting. So I want to end the May world of that second matter as well. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't know at this point I'll have to get into the TARDIS to sort of go back in time to be able to answer a couple of those questions. Um, actually, Minister, in the introduction I said I would allow about an hour. All oh, right, okay. okay. <laughs> I, I, and I'm sure your, your generosity of spirit is, is great. Look, in terms of, I, in terms of the subsidy, but, you know, we can call it hardship fund, we can call it whatever. It's about trying to get some level of, of funding that, that's there. I think the issue is that the demands that are there from society as a whole across a range of government departments at present, what is in the budget uh, across all sectors is not enough to be able to, to deal with that. And I suppose, given, if you like, the normal means to which, uh, as a country, we would be able, in Northern Ireland, we're dependent, largely speaking, upon what is there in the block grant, what is there in Barnet Consequentials. The way that that, in many ways, can be increased at times has been through, for instance, regional rates, there's relatively small levers, but that, is, from a practical point of view, is not really an option at present. So it is about... There is no lack of willingness, I think, across the board to be able to try and tackle those issues. At the moment, uh, what has been 
if you like, sort of presented by way of, of economic packages is, is where we've reached in terms of what is available, I think, with the exception of a, a wider issue which is coming up in terms of the broader transport uh, side of things. Um, so it is a question of trying to tailor whatever we can. It can only happen if there's additional money that's, that's, that's able to be levered in. Having said that, I think this is a little bit of a movable feast in relation to the uh, situation uh, that there does seem to be at times various uh, pots of money which seem to be becoming available uh, as we move on. So from that point of view, it's, 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 not, it's not hopeless in that, in that regard. Uh, in terms of the asylum seekers, I think I've already mentioned that particularly that we're working directly with the, the Home Office in relation to that to be able to provide that level of funding, uh, particularly for uh, children. The Communities uh, Minister has already announced a package which will look particularly at providing uh, particularly food support for, for a range of um, vulnerable people within our society, which I think asylum seekers would, would come under, so that side of it. Um, in terms of the Wi-Fi situation, uh, certainly I think that's, I don't have detail to hand in relation to that, but it could be something that could be looked at. Thank you, Minister, for answering the questions and for your statement. Uh, we shall now have a brief suspension of five minutes prior to the next statement from the Communities Minister. Could I remind you, folks, just the, the opening statement about using the appropriate doors just to maintain the social distancing? And the meeting shall resume again in five minutes. Thank you. Order, members. Could I ask you all to take your seats? The meeting is about to resume. Agenda item number four is a statement from the Minister for Communities. The Speaker received notification on the 7th of April that the Minister wished to make a statement to the ad hoc committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to make is included in your pack at page 27. I would like to welcome the Minister for Communities to this meeting of the committee. I invite the Minister to make her statement which should be heard by members without interruption. Following the statement, there will then be an opportunity for members to ask questions. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargy. Thanks very much and hello everyone. I suppose firstly I just want to formally recognise the many difficulties and challenges uh, which people and communities, particularly our most vulnerable, are facing at this time. And as Minister for the Department of Communities, I am committed to doing everything in my power to support the most vulnerable within our society. Today, I welcome the opportunity to update this Assembly on the important work which I have undertaken to support and protect people in need during this public health emergency. In recent weeks, intensive work has taken place across the Department for Communities in partnership with our multiple partner organisations to ensure that those most in need are protected and receive the necessary help and support they require. One of my key priorities has been to ensure continued delivery of benefits to those that need it and to introduce necessary changes to the system to provide additional support and flexibilities in these extraordinary times. To date, work has been completed to change the necessary legislation, regulations and operational procedures to provide easier and faster access to universal credit, personal independence payments, job seekers allowance, employment support allowance and discretionary support. We have seen unprecedented demand in terms of new claims for universal credit, with 45,000 cases received in the last three weeks alone, a tenfold increase. As a result, we have reconfigured a lot of our services to make the payment of the benefit to those um, who need it our first priority. And since, since the 16th of March, the average number of claims received each week has been 16,650. This can be compared to a weekly average of 1,950 new claims before this emergency began. Significant operational adjustments have been put in place uh, which put a priority on payments and supporting the most vulnerable. And in the last three weeks, we have made over 35,000 regular payments to Universal Credit, um, with 99% of those paid on time. Our average speed of answering calls um, during this three weeks um, is under three minutes, and we are answering nearly 95% of calls um, offered to us. Yet there will be exceptions, but please recognise the context in which our staff are delivering against. 
All of this has been delivered uh, with a much reduced workforce due to the circumstances we are operating under. This has resulted in available staff being redirected to priority areas, including dealing with our new claims for universal credit and discretionary support, and maintaining the important telephony services. And indeed, I visited a few of the offices um, within the last two weeks just to meet with staff and to view the situation myself. And I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to our staff within the department and right across the department who are providing an exceptional public service under the most severe pressures. Their determination and hard work has helped to ensure that important services continue to be delivered um, in this really difficult time. These important changes um, to our operations have presented significant challenges for managers and for staff within the organisation. And we have worked closely with trade unions to ensure that uh, they comply with social distancing guidelines across our office uh, network. And I have increased cleaning regimes to protect our staff. And I also met the trade unions on site within one of our offices in Belfast recently. Many staff are now working road systems to ensure that these guidelines are strictly adhered to, and I would commend them for their dedication in working long hours and over weekends to ensure that vital public services are delivered. Members will be aware that uh, the Universal Credit Standard Allowance has increased for everyone by £86.67 uh, a month, and in addition, everyone making a new claim to Universal Credit can now apply for a non-repayable Universal Credit Contingency Fund grant, and that's only available here, um, and that's available through the Discretionary Support uh, Programme. This is published through NI Direct, the main citizen facing information portal, um, as well as the department's social media channels and through the network of independent advice, sector and community groups. And in terms of discretionary support, I have taken a number of steps to improve our ability to respond to the increased demand. I have amended the regulations to widen the grant eligibility criteria to provide a grant for short-term living expenses to assist claimants specifically affected by COVID-19. And an online application for our new living expenses grant is now available, and staff have been redeployed to this area to ensure that we can manage the increase in applications. I have also suspended face-to-face -face assessments across the Jobs and Benefits Network, and this includes medical assessments for PIP and DSA, to ensure continuity of awards. Across, um, sorry, access to um, telephony channels will continue to be available for anyone claiming universal credit, PIP, ESA, job seekers and discretionary support. However, given the significant staff absences experienced across all benefit operational areas and the potential long delays in answering calls, new online application forms for ESA, JSA and discretionary support, COVID-19 living expenses, are now available on the NI Direct site. The forms can be downloaded, completed and emailed directly to the relevant uh, benefit area for processing. And due to the COVID-19 emergency, some households and social homes may face difficulties with paying rent, which are, is beyond their control. And I can assure these households that their home is secure and they will not be evicted. Both the housing executive and all of the housing associations have given a commitment to treat all rent issues with sensitivity. This will support tenants through this difficult period. And the Department will be working with housing associations and the housing executive to help keep um, tenants in their homes and to ensure that the welfare system can provide help uh, to their tenants as fast as, as fast as possible. The package of measures recently announced by the British Chancellor, alongside changes to the local housing allowance rates and increase in periods of discretionary housing payments, provides some assurance to both tenants and landlords at this time. I have also announced the proposed housing executive rent increase will be put on hold until October 20 this year. And people um, are worried about their jobs and the impacts um, of this crisis on their families. And I don't want them to face additional pressures about whether they can pay their rent or not. And my officials um, and I are also exploring the groups, people who remain adversely affected by COVID-19, the scale um, of this issue. 
and we are continuing to look at future uh, mechanisms available to the Department to support these groups in the time ahead. I am particularly focused on how we can protect the homeless during this period, and we have been working with the Housing Executive, who have taken a number of emergency measures, including the sourcing of additional temporary accommodation for those who are homeless or threatened with homelessness. I am thankful uh, that we have had no one currently sleeping on the streets of Belfast and Derry for the last two weeks. And I commend those who have worked with us in the Public Health Agency, the Department of Health, the PSNI, the Probation Board, and particularly those local homeless providers um, to ensure the protection of our most vulnerable groups. The departments make the call. Helpline has prioritised its available resources in line of the decision to step back from home visits and attending community events in order to protect vulnerable people and minimise the spread of COVID-19. All additional resources have been redeployed to the telephony team to increase its capacity to assist with those in need, to access benefit advice and other supports and services. And I know that this is a vital service, um, has been a lifeline to many vulnerable people during this crisis, and we will ensure that the necessary resources remain in place to continue that service. My department has also worked closely with Advice ANI to support the establishment of a free phone COVID-19 community helpline. This service is available nine to five, seven days a week, to ensure that the most vulnerable and those at risk of COVID-19 have access to practical support and services and emotional support at this difficult time. The Department also provides funding to Advice ANI for the Independent Welfare Changes Helpline, which is also another um, important source of information for the public. Whilst the main focus of the Department has been responding to the ongoing crisis situation, I have continued to progress important work in relation to welfare mitigations. A draft bill to, the, to allow the extension of those mitigation payments for the bedroom tax has been shared with the executive, and once approval to proceed um, has been granted, then the department will ensure that this is formally presented to the Assembly as quickly as possible. The legislation to extend the remaining welfare mitigation schemes will be led shortly after the bill. However, the Department um, has now implemented contingency arrangements with mitigation payments under the sole authority of the Budget Act from 1 April 2020. This approach has been agreed by the Department of Finance and was announced by the Minister of Finance during his opening statement of the Assembly on the Budget Bill on 25 February this year. The use of the Budget Act will allow the Department to make the payments to people who otherwise uh, be entitled to welfare supplementary payments. This approach is an exceptional measure that is necessary to protect people and to ensure that uh, payments continue to be made. This approach will continue for a short period until the relevant legislation to extend the mitigation schemes is approved by this Assembly. At this point, I would like uh, to place on record my sincere thanks to all of our community and voluntary sector partners who continue to deliver essential and important services within their communities. And I want to put on place the Voluntary and Community Sectors Emergency Leadership Group, which was established by me um, in February. And their role is to support and input um, from local government and other stakeholders. This group has a key role in providing collective leadership across government and grassroots community organisations and to develop and implement urgent measures for protecting and supporting communities in need. This partnership approach has been demonstrated this week with the introduction of the new weekly food distribution service, and my department is investing £10 million in this service over the next three months, which will see 10,000 food boxes being delivered each week to the most vulnerable within society during this current lockdown. The box of mainly non-perishable goods will be delivered directly to the door of vulnerable people who have been notified to shield by their GPs and who do not have access to local support networks. These boxes will also be available to those who are not shielding but are in critical need of food. Whilst my department is leading on this initiative, it has only been made possible through the collaborative working with the health trusts, local councils and importantly, the voluntary and community sector um, at the grassroots. And we have also been working with the private sector as well. 
This vital service will ensure that those most in need in our society um, and who do not have a support network or family or friends to help them through this emergency will have access to basic food supplies. It will also allow those at risk of social isolation to see a friendly face and to know that society has not forgotten about them. There is a tremendous amount of goodwill and generosity in action across our society, which is to be very welcome at this challenging time. The Department has taken the lead in responding to the challenges that the community and voluntary um, organisations face and introducing a range of flexibilities in terms and conditions around grant funding, including upfront payments and reduced bureaucracy. In addition, we have introduced a COVID-19 community support fund, and this week I wrote to the 11 local authorities around releasing 1.5 million initially through that fund, um, through local government's existing community support programme. This funding will enable our local councils um, to directly support grassroots uh, organisations in tackling poverty and helping those in greatest need. We have also released 200,000 um, to the Community Foundation's Small Grants Programme, and it's part of their COVID, um, COVID response programme. And I am pleased to work with the Education Minister um, to announce the new scheme for direct payments for families who would normally benefit from free school meals. And I'm sure you touched on it earlier that that also extends over the Easter period to ensure that no child um, goes hungry during that time. One of the positive aspects to arise from this um, emergency has been the willingness of people to reach out, to help others, to volunteer their services across a range of areas. And I am pleased to work with Volunteer Now in launching their campaign, Help Each Other, to direct new volunteers to their online registration and matching platform. And since the launch of this campaign, we have seen over 2,000 people registering and expressing their support. And existing volunteers across health trusts, sporting bodies and other large organisations are also being coordinated to respond to the immediate needs of people. I am conscious that other sectors are facing significant challenges at this time. I recently announced a new £1 million um, COVID Creative uh, Support Fund, which will be a mechanism to support individual artists and institutions in finding innovative ways to combat uh, social isolation and address well-being challenges. The arts sector uh, has such an important role to play in keeping spirits high and promoting creativity in difficult times. I have also asked my officials to work with Sport NI and the Sports Forum to consider immediate practical steps which can be taken to support sporting organisations. And to date, this has involved the early release of the grants for uh, 2020 to 21. And we are also seeking to have a programme in place to provide emergency financial relief to grassroots sports organisations. We are all involved in a vast, um, moving and challenging situation which demands high flexibility and responsiveness um, approach right across government, and particularly with our partners in the voluntary community and private sectors. And I will continue to work closely with executive colleagues, with the Committee for Communities, and also with this Assembly to ensure that we do all in our power to limit the damage of this deadly health emergency and to particularly protect those most vulnerable within our communities. I know I will have your full support for the measures we have introduced so far, and I am happy to engage further uh, with members to explore how we can all work together to protect everyone within our society. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your statement. I thank the Minister for making her statement, and I will now invite members to ask questions of the Minister. Um, you know the routine, folks. Short, focused questions to the Minister and no speeches beforehand. Uh, the one exception is, and I'm sure she'll not abuse this, is the Chair of the Committee, uh, Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I'll certainly try not to abuse that. Um, can I firstly thank the Minister for her very comprehensive statement? I think that just shows um, the amount of work that you and your department have done over the past few weeks, um, especially in, in helping those most, most vulnerable in our community. And can I also, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, put on record on a personal level 
your thanks for um, including me in many of those updates as chair of the committee also. And also, can I thank the voluntary community sector? You're absolutely right when we say about positive aspects. Some of the stuff that we're seeing on, on our social media has been truly imaginative by the voluntary and community sector. So well done them. And also those many neighbours out there that are looking after um, the people within our community. Um, I just want to touch on, on uh, two issues, and I'm not going to go over anything that was discussed in committee on Monday. Um, the first one is uh, to do with the collaborative working um, between councils in the voluntary and community sector going forward, especially with the, the food boxes and with the, the crisis grant um, coming in. It's just to know, is that on a statutory setting um, or on a more formal setting um, so that, the, that this is ruled out in, in a way that um, all councils have the direction that they require to take it forward? We've noticed over the last week there's been a bit of, of, of ad hoc approach um, to the food boxes, and that's no criticism on you whatsoever. That's just saying that there hasn't been the direction there. And secondly, can I also ask you, Minister, um, about the, the priority shopping again? And I know that this is in uh, um, other parts of the UK, and I know in, indeed in Great Britain it, it, it's not perfect. It's far from perfect. But we have a situation here where people are still waiting, whether that's for baby food, whether that's for nappies, for sanitary products um, also as well, um, that people can't get access to priority shopping. So I'd just ask if you and the Health Minister could look at that again and see if there's a, a, a way forward to that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, I suppose it's a very uh, fast-moving situation, and obviously people are in crisis now, um, and we're trying to work as quickly as we can to respond to the situation. I suppose we do have a formal relationship with local government, and that's Solis set on the emergency group, um, which is across the executive. I've also established the community and voluntary sector emergencies leadership group, which would include regional um, organisations, it includes local government, they're represented again as well, and then it also includes grassroots community organisations um, also. The way that we have looked at the parcels, um, we're obviously working through local councils um, formally, where each council has been asked to set up um, distribution hubs, um, because, and we feel that it's better to work through councils because they know their communities the most. They've developed community plans. They have looked at issues of um, inequality and poverty within their own areas as well. Um, and we are working with them. The difficulty, and when you look at England, and this will feed into the shopping list, is that the English healthcare system has one database in which you're working from. And because we have multiple trusts in that, we have multiple databases. So trying to get that information through, um, trying not to breach GDPR rules and protocols, and I know we're not operating in a normal climate, um, has proven a bit more burdensome than what you would initially think. So officers are, there's cross-departmental uh, working with my department, also with the Department of Health. We're working with the local health trusts, and I know each trust um, within council areas are also working together as well collaboratively to try and get those lists established um, as quickly as possible to make sure that they're, they're streamlined. Um, and that will develop over the coming weeks. We'll start to see a better consistency um, happening across the next few weeks. The last thing we don't want to do, and I suppose this service, there's initially 10,400 parcels that have been identified. We don't want to leave anybody out. So we know the issue of poverty more generally um, is an area, is a, an impact, um, and particularly at this time when people are losing, losing their jobs, when they have reduced income. We don't want anybody to feel that they have to go hungry. So we can scale up um, these boxes. We can make sure that other people can be added. Uh, they can phone the COVID uh, free phone community helpline and they can self-refer on that helpline or they can work through um, local uh, independent advice sector organisations. They can be referred that way or from grassroots community organisations working with the local council that can then refer in and to respond to that local need. Um, so that's how it's been operating at the minute. It, it hasn't been working perfectly because of the scenario um, that we're working in. But I am confident that over the coming weeks, um, we will start to, I suppose, close any gaps that may be there um, in the time ahead to ensure that, again, no one goes hungry uh, during this period. Minister, I want to thank you and commend you on your leadership uh, and the speedy action and the level of support you have made available to those most in need. I've been involved in my own community 
uh, in delivering some of that support, and people are very grateful, in particular for the free school meal payment and the food boxes. And I also want to commend the community and voluntary sector. Minister, this is rightly a worrying period, and with reduced household incomes, I'm being asked by constituents for clarity on bedroom tax. Minister, can you provide an estimated time frame for when the executive will approve the paper on the extension of the bedroom tax? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for your question. I suppose I answered some of it in the opening statement. I have the bill drafted. It's been presented to the executive, and I'm just waiting for that to be signed off within the executive. I think the key thing is, is that the payments are continuing, so they didn't stop in April, and it was important that those um, payments did continue for all of the mitigations that were there before the start of April, um, and that will continue until the agreement and until the legislation comes in. So it has been drafted, it's ready to go, it just needs to have the executive approval. The regulations are drafted, they're ready to go as well. They'll not take as long because it doesn't need the legislation, um, but the payments are still continuing at this time. As soon as I can present that to this chamber, I'll be doing that as, um, as quickly as I possibly can. But no one will feel the impact. They won't see the difference because those uh, payments are continuing to flow. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for her statement and uh, commend her department for the fantastic uh, manner in which they have responded to this crisis. I'd like to pay particular tribute to those on the front line and those on the phone line, as well, as well as in the advice services, but also to thank those in the back rooms who sometimes get forgotten about, but whose busyness is reflected in the plethora of positive press releases that we're seeing emanating from the Minister's Department that's reflective of the great work going on there. Uh, last night, the Minister will be aware that the Chancellor uh, made an announcement around a new £700 million package to support uh, charities. And subsequent to that, there was a statement from our Secretary of State to say that Northern Ireland will receive at least £10 million of that. I wonder, is the Minister yet in a position to clarify how much money charities here in the North will get of that, the importance of such support for the charity sector, particularly at this time, and has she envisaged how any such scheme might be rolled out in the future? Yeah, no, well, I know it's a worrying time for a lot of charities, and particularly those that are delivering such as like end-of-life care um, facilities that you just can't close down. And they would have relied very heavily on um, donations and sponsorship, and obviously that's not there now um, because of the restrictions in place. My understanding is the finance minister is looking at that at the minute. I don't know what the definitive budget is um, at, the moment, at the moment from the Barnet consequentials. Um, he's looking at that at the moment. He's in discussions um, with the Treasury, and uh, he'll be making an announcement soon. We do have an executive meeting tomorrow, um, so whether he's bringing the update to that meeting, I'm not sure of yet. I haven't seen the agenda, but I imagine that that will be announced in the coming days, because the priority for us is to get that money released as soon as possible, because charities are closing now at the moment. I'm sure you've seen that, and to make sure that that money um, is directed at those who need it. Um, so I'm sure once that's announced, um, you members will be informed. Can I echo the sentiments of my committee member across the way, indeed in commending the minister, um, her backroom, backroom staff, uh, and all of the officials within the department, and indeed the many organisations right across Northern Ireland, and indeed individuals who have stepped up to the mark selflessly to support each other within the respective communities. The Minister in her statement makes mention to the Universal Credit Contingency Fund, and indeed she has highlighted the fact that, that, that this is unique to Northern Ireland. Uh, Minister, can you outline uh, if you are satisfied that the current budget for the Contingency Fund is sufficient to meet the, the number and the scale of individuals who may require to avail of it? You have highlighted a tenfold increase, 45,000 in over three weeks. Is there enough within that budget? Is there the provision um, to increase that budget if need be? Yeah, no, thanks very much for this. And obviously, we're keeping these under constant review. I engage with the staff um, within our social security system on a regular basis because of the, the pressure that that system is under. We do have the, the finances at the minute in terms of the contingency fund, and obviously, we have bid within the COVID uh, monies for increased money. 
around contingency and also discretionary support. And we're obviously waiting just on the announcement um, from that um, to flow uh, at the moment. And obviously, we're going to be making additional changes to discretionary support around the income threshold to ensure that more people can avail. But we are satisfied at the moment that the money is there um, for those who need it. We've paid out over £300,000 um, in terms of support so far. And we know that if the criteria is changed, that will increase again. So we're keeping it under constant review. I know executive colleagues are supportive of this when it's coming forward because it is going directly to families who need it. Um, but we are OK at the moment. Um, and as I say, if more resources needed, then we're making those bids um, into the Department of Finance. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking the Minister. Um, I'm sure it has been some baptism of fire for you. Um, and can I also say that the staff that you have in communities have excelled. Um, I think everybody in the community, um, the thousands upon thousands of people who are dependent on them at the moment, would like them to know that their work hasn't gone unnoticed. Um, quite a few have asked, or asked questions that I was going to ask you, but there's one thing that I am quite cautious about, Minister, and it is the number of people who have been applying for universal credit. We now have people who have come into the system of benefits who have never, ever faced this before. Um, they have never understood exactly how much paperwork people have had to go through, and I hope that there will be a change in society's attitude towards people who do have to live on benefits, given that more people see what they have to go through. But what I want to ask, Minister, is what preparations are going to happen for those people who have applied for universal credit because their cash flow has been in difficulty, but they're maybe waiting for furloughing or they're waiting for a redundancy package to come in, and how do we help those people to understand when that money comes in and it comes into their bank account, they may well be moved out of the universal credit system again because there's a lump sum of money comes in there. Can you give any assurances to people that, that we will know that that is furloughing money or that is redundancy money? Um, and just to explain to those people, now they're in benefits, what happens to them? Yeah, well, I suppose at the minute, I mean, I know a couple have touched on it in terms of the staff, and the staff have been absolutely amazing um, under real extreme pressures. And as I say, that's why I made it my point to go out um, around a number of the offices um, just over a week ago. Obviously, they're afraid um, because they're, they're going to work. Um, they have loved ones, family ones, maybe people with underlying health conditions. But they're also, um, I suppose, determined that they are public servants delivering essential frontline services, um, like many other low-paid workers um, that we're seeing throughout this crisis. Um, and I have to commend the work that they're doing. They've been absolutely brilliant. I have not um, engaged or encountered any barriers. People are actually putting their hands up to get involved. Um, and I have to say fair play to each and every one of them. Um, I think the issue, I mean, we have stood down certain business areas within the department, um, and that's to ensure our first priority is to make sure that benefit payments are made, that we can get those payments out um, as quickly as possible. And then we'll pick up on that other work um, behind the scenes. Universal credit obviously takes real-time information now um, in terms of where people's incomes are at at the minute. They're obviously getting advice. We're putting more resources into our universal credit team because it is under pressure. We have also people working from home because it's a, an, an online system. Um, they're able to do that from home as well. And again, they're working weekends, they're working nighttime to make sure that we can respond to this as much as possible. So they are offering those additional supports to people that are coming in. They're also meeting on a regular basis with their independent advice sector um, via online virtual meetings. Um, and that's proved really beneficial as well, because any changes that have happened, uh, the independent advice sector is getting that out to communities and out to people that they would engage with. Because like you say, there has been thousands who have never um, had to engage with the benefit system um, that are now doing it within social security. Um, so we are continuing to support them. I know there's plans in place now within the department, whilst our priority now is to focus on getting payments out. We are obviously looking at, well, what's the next phase of this? What is it we need to be doing? So plans are being drawn up at the moment, and that's being constantly reviewed on a daily basis, if not by an hourly basis, um, by Colm uh, and the rest of his team. So we'll update members as we're, sorry, as we're moving through these periods. And I suppose the big thing for me, I know it was touched on there, I mean, I think what people really see is what people in the social security system have to live on. They see the impact of that now. 
Um, and I do hope after this um, emergency that people do look at society differently, um, that we do look at embedding a rights-based approach um, and that we have a new economic order which protects those most vulnerable within our society because we're seeing through this crisis the frontline workers are our lowest paid workers um, and something needs to change. Thank the Minister for his statement. It rightly prioritises uh, the protection of the most vulnerable. We know that a tragic reality of COVID-19 is death and the agonising task of arranging a funeral. Uh, the Minister talked yesterday in a press conference of the 78 families so far that wouldn't be able to say goodbye to loved ones. Difficult, but accepted begrudgingly in these difficult circumstances. But would the Minister agree with me that that stands in stark contrast to what, to, what has appeared to have happened yesterday in County Tyrone, where a mass public gathering uh, at a Republican uh, funeral um, of a former Sinn Féin councillor took place in County Tyrone. This has caused much distress, as has been outlined by my colleague, uh, Mr Buchanan, and has caused much distress to families that have had to bury loved ones in isolation and on their own. It's caused a lot of mixed messaging. Minister, would you join with me in condemning this activity, this reckless behaviour, and would you raise it with your executive colleagues and indeed the appropriate authorities? Before the Minister responds to that, if you want to sit, yeah. the member is very close from being far removed from the content of the Minister's statement. In the context of the Minister's previous remarks at press conference and the fact that she related to community groups and their work, uh, and the member prefaced that. I will allow that, but he was on very thin ice with that question. The Minister. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, this is a difficult time. Uh, people are dying um, from this virus, um, and loved ones are losing loved ones that they can't say goodbye to. Um, and it is important that people adhere to the public health guidance, um, the messages that are putting out there, and I suppose what it was said yesterday, and I even seen the PSNI say this, that they don't want to revert in the first instance to enforcement. They want to try and engage with people. They want to try and work with people. They want society as a whole. We know that these are draconian measures um, that are being brought in, and I think that's accepted, but I think on the whole people understand the reasons for it. Um, and what I would uh, say today, again, and reiterate, is that we need to work collectively as a community to save lives um, at this time and that I would appeal to anyone out there um, to adhere to the public health guidance to ensure that they are doing that um, so that we can save lives. Glass Ken Corlea. Like other colleagues across the chamber, I too want to thank the Minister for the work and mitigations that she has initiated to ensure the most vulnerable are protected as best as possible. Can the Minister provide additional details on how the partnerships involved in the collation and delivery of the shielding boxes will work on the ground? Yes, yeah, sorry, as was touched on earlier, obviously we're both working with the local health trusts and collating the database of names of people that they would have that would be vulnerable. The 40,000 letters that went out to those who have been asked to shield here in the north also had the phone number of the COVID free phone community helpline. So they have been asked that if they feel that they have no family support um, or they can't gain access to food uh, because they've been asked to stay in, they can self-refer um, on that database and we're taking names that way. We're obviously working with local councils as well. So each council area has been asked to establish um, hubs within their council areas where these parcels can then be dropped off by the food suppliers and then they can be distributed out. We're also asking local council areas because they know their communities. Um, local community organisations know their communities as well. So we're asking people to feed in information in the names of those who are vulnerable. And again, anyone who feels that they're vulnerable, even if you didn't get a letter from the doctor, you feel that you're vulnerable and that you've no support network, you can self-refer through the free phone COVID community helpline as well. So we're trying to use as many avenues as we can. Obviously, we don't have one single database or list, and that does prove difficult. So we are trying to find other ways um, to close any gap that there is to make sure that no one falls through uh, the net um, in the time ahead. And we need everybody's effort in ensuring that we can do that. And we're seeing it at the moment, football teams, Gaelic teams, rugby teams, church groups, community groups. 
um, at the grassroots who are all getting behind this effort. Um, and we just need to make sure that we're getting the word out there that these food boxes are here. Um, and here's how you can refer in to them. So it will change over the next couple of weeks. Hopefully we'll be able to refine it more. Um, we'll be bringing more people into that. Also with the funding, the 1.5 million that's going to local councils, that can also be used in terms of food security. Um, so local councils I've seen in Belfast, for example, and I've seen it in other dairy and other areas as well. Um, Lisburn also, where local community groups are putting together food parcels um, also, and they're doing that. So I would rather somebody gets two food parcels than none. Um, and I suppose, obviously, as we're moving forward over the next couple of weeks, we want to make sure that nobody falls through. So engage with the local council, get community groups involved um, through the councils. And obviously, we're doing the work through the health trusts as well. We're also working with the three sporting codes, Ulster GAA, IFA and Ulster Rugby. And again, how can we use their membership um, of activists and volunteers? Um, and one of the particular areas that we're trying to work with them on is the distribution of essential medicine um, prescriptions for those, again, who are shielding and who are vulnerable as well. So hopefully we'll have that rolling out in the coming weeks also. Deputy uh, Principal Speaker, um, can I thank the Minister for coming to the Assembly and, and for giving us that comprehensive statement. She's right to point out all of the different sporting groups and community organisations that are doing great work, and I'm, I'm pleased that you name-checked Lisburn in that, because there are quite a number of the groups, um, some that she's already met uh, in Ballymacash, for example, and they have a specific COVID-19 response effort that's taken place and, uh, and are doing fantastic work, so thank you for that. Um, in terms of our supermarkets, uh, in Great Britain, we have schemes in place whereby those supermarkets have been able to identify uh, the most vulnerable in order to prioritise the delivery of goods. Your department, I understand, uh, is leading on this in terms of engagement with supermarkets, and I think it is important that we get a system in place uh, that people can get the delivery of those goods um, because of the demand that has been put in place and the lack of their access to supermarkets. And I do think it's important, Minister, uh, in light of the Deputy First Minister, who has went out of her way to call out ministers, businesses, whenever they have breached, that you take the opportunity to call out the incident that has happened that has caused huge consternation in Ballandari in the Deputy First Minister's own constituency that my colleague Mr Bugley referred to. Well, firstly, in terms of supermarkets and that, we are working with the, the main retailers and supply chains around seeing what we can do. As I said, the difficulty at the moment is we don't have one database, and we're obviously trying to quickly establish that database and pull it together so that that can be shared. Supermarkets also have to create a system, an IT, online IT system for that as well. So there has been really good discussions. Um, with the supermarkets around seeing how we can identify those who are vulnerable. Um, I am hopeful over the coming week or so that we will get a resolution to that, and then that can open uh, new slots. I think it's also important to notice, and again, you're seeing this through the power of social media, a lot of small independent retailers are also now doing home deliveries, and I think it is important um, that we show support to them as well, because they're doing some brilliant initiatives where they're even supporting um, local food banks, um, local church halls, local sports halls, um, and the delivery of food to those who need it most. And I know they have opened up services. Again, if you contact the Consumer Council, they have an online list of all those local small independent retailers. And again, if you phone the COVID uh, free phone community helpline, um, you can also get a list of a retailer in your local area as well. Um, to ensure that we can get that. And then, obviously, we're also looking at the Volunteer Now list, again, linking in with local councils and community organisations. There are a list of volunteers there that can go and collect shopping for people as well. And, obviously, we're trying to match volunteers um, to people who may be vulnerable or who maybe have to shield um, during this public health emergency. And so it will come in different forms, but, obviously, we are working uh, with the supermarkets in the time ahead. I suppose on your last point, I mean, I'm not here to get into a political squabble or to call out every um, single incident where people may not be following the public health um, emergency, because I think that leads you down a rabbit hole that there's no return, and I just don't think it helps anyone. People are dying. Um, people are losing their lives. Loved ones, um, families are now grieving at the loss of loved ones, and I've seen this even in my own community 
where an elderly mother or grandmother has lost her life and that family will not see her again. I think my role as a political leader is to call on people to follow the public health um, advice, is to ask them um, to do that because this does save lives. And I think the more that we can encourage people to do that, the PSNI, other enforcement agencies are doing the same. Their first port of call is to engage, is to encourage, and then if, if uh, nothing is listened to, then to look at enforcement. But it is very much about engaging and encouraging first. And that's what I would want to do here today. And I'll continue to do that in the time ahead, along with my other executive ministers. I call Ms Shania Dennis. Um, undoubtedly, the COVID-19 um, crisis has had an, an immediate impact on our sports uh, scene, and the decision by the sporting codes, all the sporting codes, to cease activities and to cease uh, competition will not have been an easy decision to make, but it is undoubtedly the right decision to make um, at this time. And I want to uh, commend all the sporting organisations, but particularly the, the governing bodies of, um, of the GEA, um, of soccer and of rugby um, for stepping up to the mark and playing their part in the civic response uh, to this crisis and to commend the Minister, she alluded, alluded to it in her statement, uh, some of the support that she's making available for our, our sports uh, clubs. But I wonder if the Minister could provide some more detail, um, a little bit more detail on what action she's taken um, at this time to support our sports sector um, and what measures she's going to introduce or is she th thinking of introducing in the future um, to relieve the financial burden and the uncertainty that the, our sports scene and our grassroots sports clubs are facing at this time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. I suppose one of my last range visits that had to be cancelled before this crisis was actually going to Windsor Park. So it was to visit um, one of our sports grounds. Um, and obviously sports play is a really good contribution and what we do, we want to make sure that they're sustained at the other end of this um, emergency. Because obviously we know um, physical inactivity, uh, mental health issues as a result and coming out at the other end, we're going to need our sports teams in order to lift morale and spirits um, within our community. So they play a vital role um, there. My department officials, um, I've instructed them over the last couple of weeks and they have been engaging with the sports forum. They've been engaging uh, with the sport and codes um, across the north as well, looking at what the issues are. And again, I've intended, I've set out and also launched that I intend to uh, roll out a sport relief fund. And that is around trying to work with grassroots sporting organisations to give financial assistance to them in the time ahead. We're just finalising the criteria around that fund and we're obviously doing that in engagement with the sporting codes themselves and with the sports forum. And we're hoping to announce that uh, soon. I have also obviously engaged with the Minister of the Economy around the issue of rates. Um, and I've uh, wrote uh, to her just recently, and I know she's looking at this in the wider context of business support and rates also. Um, to see what we can do to ensure that maybe sports clubs can be included um, in the relief that's being uh, laid out. I know there is an executive meeting tomorrow. I'm not sure if this is going to be on the table yet, but obviously those uh, conversations are ongoing with the sporting teams. But I will continue to engage uh, with them. My officials are engaging with them uh, on a weekly basis um, to ensure that they are sustained beyond this emergency. Um, I can thank the Minister for her statements and, uh, like her, can I applaud the, applaud the work of your department um, in unison with so many other sporting organisations and community and voluntary groups who are working together in a surge of goodwill and volunteerism, which is phenomenal and which will hopefully help us all to defeat COVID-19. The Minister may or may not be aware of the financial quandary many cross-border workers now find themselves in as an outcome of the COVID-19 pandemic. Cross-border workers who have helped to rebuild the economy on this island, who pay their taxes, who have mortgages, families to feed, bills to pay, and many of whom are not eligible for universal credit because of their own specific particular circumstances. Will the Minister back the call from, the, from Colin Eastwood the MP for Foyle, for an urgent meeting of the North South Ministerial Council to provide a bespoke, or agree a bespoke financial package, support package for those cross border workers who are falling between the cracks and who have no supports from the existing COVID 19 support schemes. Thank you, Minister. 
I suppose the executive have already, through um, First Deputy First Minister, the Finance Minister, and of course um, the Minister for the Economy, has already been in conversations um, on this issue. They've been engaging with um, the Irish government in the south on this issue um, to see if a resolution can be found. Um, and obviously, we have seen the strife uh, that many people living in border communities are facing. Um, and I know that there's even been commentary in the south of Ireland. Um, around this particular issue. So hopefully there can be a resolution so, uh, found as soon as possible um, to it. But I know that it's high up on the agenda around the executive table and that it has been discussed um, with the Tanistia, um and with others within the Southern Government. Um, I suppose part of the next phase in terms of community support that I'm rolling out, I'm obviously conscious of um, rural poverty. Um, and the issue of poverty in and around our border communities. When you look at poverty, um, whilst I've uh, initially announced 1.5 million going to local councils, I want to look at a second tranche, which will start to look at the issue of rural poverty. I'm going to be working with Edwin Poots, obviously, in terms of DERA, to see if there are things that we can be doing jointly. But obviously, picking up as part of that COVID community support fund, it will be looking at areas around access to food, those who are on low income and struggling at this time, and also the issue of connectivity. So it is high up on the agenda within the executive. Um, there's obviously no resolution as of yet, but there has been direct engagements uh, with the Tanistia and with the government uh, more broadly. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for her statement today and also for her kind words as was picked up by the member from Lagan Valley, Mr Given, with regard to the, the effort within the community in Lisburn and Lagan Valley. Um, Paul made mention of Balmacais, but there's also um, Lagan View Enterprise, which you're aware of, uh, and you've met them, and they're putting in a tremendous effort, and Via Wings, and I believe at some stage you may up, indeed take up a, uh, an invitation to go and visit and see the good work they're, they're doing there. I want to thank the Minister for the efforts that she has made, and as, as um, my, my colleague uh, Kelly Armstrong has said, you've, uh, you've hit the rails uh, running. Um, just been a, a new MLA. Um, and I just want to thank you for the, the effort that your staff are putting in, um, because many of us will have been in contact with uh, all of those involved in, in your department and, and in all the facets of that, and they've been only too ready to offer help. And it's on that very point I would just like to ask, uh, Minister. Um, obviously, there will be uh, some elements of sickness, and there will be a lot of people trying desperately hard to meet the needs of the most vulnerable in our society. Um, would you be confident that you have the support mechanism for, for your workers there uh, who are carrying a heavy burden like, like all, of, uh, all of those on the front line and that the support services are not only just there at the moment for, for, for the hour of need but will confidently carry through in, uh, to uh, the, the time when we need to uh, revisit normal business here? No, thanks very much. And it's a good question because sometimes they're nearly forgot about um, because they're not always seen um, face to face. Um, but they are essential frontline workers, and I think that can't be forgot about. They're delivering essential services, sometimes to our most vulnerable within our communities. And as I said, I mean, I went out around some of the offices, and people are frightened. Um, they're afraid, and whilst there were issues at the start in terms of distancing because of the nature of these offices, people work um, quite closely together. So obviously, after the last couple of weeks with engagements with the trade unions as well, and I met the trade union um, NIPSA on site in one of the offices uh, recently, we have had to put in measures to ensure that there is social distancing, to make sure that we're protecting uh, workers that are there, to make sure that workstations are cleaned on a regular basis um, throughout the day, because that was some of the concern for people who were coming in um, and doing their job. We have a good part of the workforce that are working from home, and obviously we have had to increase the IT supply to allow them to do that. Um, and we're also working staff on a rota um, as well uh, to ensure that there's not too many on the floor. Now that obviously puts a pressure on the system, and it's just something that we're continually managing. And that's why I would engage with the managers on a on a regular basis um, within our social security system because it is such a vital service, and particularly now when we're seeing almost 40,000 people need that service at this time because they've lost their, um, their jobs at the moment. So we're going to continue to work. Obviously, when we've met staff, they're nervous now, and we are concerned about the mental health impact that this is going to have, the stress that this is going to have afterwards. And again, we're going to continue to engage with the trade unions around what we can do, what other support that we can put in. 
I think more broadly, and it was an area that I was going to look at anyway before this um, emergency, is the issue of agency staff. Um, and there's a large um, population of agency staff within DFC. It's the nature of the DWP contracts because they're year-on-year -year contracts. But it's our agency staff that are at the fore at this point in time, and they're really showing their dedication to come to work every day. So I want to look at that in the longer term, um, because I feel that if you've been working there um, for a few years, then you're not agency, um, and that you should be a permanent member with the same terms and conditions as everybody else. So that's one of the areas I want to look at. I know there's obviously the ongoing negotiation around pay, um, and I think that that needs to be addressed urgently as well. And I know the unions are actively engaging with the Department of Finance on the issue of pay. And again, we're also, we've also put in measures of those working within our benefits office that we're paying for their car parking. So we're not expecting them to come in, um, mainly in Belfast, but in other areas as well, where they're coming into offices. I know there's one in Derry and others that we are covering the costs uh, for car parking. And twice a week now, we're also introducing lunches um, into the system as well to ensure that people have lunches. And again, we're going to look at what else we can do beyond this. It was a conversation I had with the unions even before this health or, um, crisis that I do recognise that many within my department are low paid staff. But it's shown in this crisis that they are delivering fundamental services that society needs, and therefore that needs to be recognised in the time ahead. So I want to play my part in making sure that we deliver on that. Thank you, Preve Lask and Cordy. And it follows on from Mr Butler's question and some of your uh, response that has actually answered the question. But you did mention that 40,000 workers have lost their jobs and are now turning towards social benefits, such as universal credit, uh, uh, to help survive uh, the current crisis and the, the impact that has on them and their families. And just in relation to the number of staff available to you, uh, in universal credit, have you enough staff at this time? Uh, are they able to process the huge amount of work that's coming their way? And I also want to add my thanks, and indeed our thanks, uh, to the staff and also to you as Minister. I can also say, uh, Prevlas, and I also want to thank the Chief Executive and the staff of the Assembly for facilitating this last couple of days' meetings. Um, it takes a huge background operation to keep this place going, and we appreciate their work as well. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, the main priority for us within the departments is to make sure benefits are maintained and that they're paid to those who need it, um, and particularly at this time. So for that reason, we have stopped certain parts of the department from working. We have redirected those staff into frontline social security benefits um, to make sure that uh, payments are being made, that applications are being processed. Those who are working from home, if they're shielding or they're not able to come because of a family member, I know there's a lot of those that have the IT equipment and they're doing a lot of that work uh, from home as well. Um, and we've just reprioritised um, the work that we're doing um, to ensure that benefits is the, is the key priority in the time ahead. We've also streamlined the forms, so even stopping like face-to-face -face assessments, closing the benefit offices to the public um, has really helped. Um, we've also streamlined the forms around JSA, around discretionary support, to ensure that we're cutting down on the bureaucracy, um, to make sure that we can get the process and times down as quickly. So things are working at the moment. We're obviously keeping it under constant review, even within the emergencies group across the executive. It's the one area that is a key priority, is to make sure that those social security payments continue to flow and that the staff are there. And I suppose it's only down to the get dedication of our staff and I can't emphasise that enough, and particularly agency staff as well, who are going above and beyond every single day in processing those payments and taking those thousands of calls and working tenfold within the department from what their normal day um, would be like, and it wouldn't be possible um, without them. Thank you. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I briefly add my condemnation to the alleged defiance of social distancing that appears to have taken place in County Tyrone and thank the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland who are staying at home to save lives during this public health emergency. Can I thank the Minister for her statement and welcome the investment that has been made in weekly food deliveries to vulnerable people in our community and commend the community and voluntary sector response to help with this scheme. Can I ask the Minister then what information is being used to ensure that these 
essential food deliveries do reach the people who need them most. As I say, there's no definitive list yet, and it's a, it's a work in progress. Obviously, we're working with health trusts in terms of the databases that they have, um, health and social care boards as well around vulnerable categories. Uh, we also know who the 40,000 people are who are shielding, and obviously we've made direct contact with those 40,000 people. And I suppose primarily the food boxes are for those that don't have existing support networks, where they don't have the availability of friends um, or family that can go and get them the essentials. This is to fill that gap. But I also recognise that there is poverty out there, um, there's inequality, and that that has an impact in terms of the finances that people have to buy essential food, and particularly at this time. So we want to make sure that those food boxes also um, reach those people. And that's why over the coming weeks, as we start to roll this out, we need all of that information coming in via local councils. We'll continue to work with the Health and Social Care Trust, with Health Trust more broadly, and with the Department of Health. We're also engaging, obviously, with, um, through the GP system and the letters that have been issued. And people on the ground, you know, people know their communities. I live in a community. I've been an activist my whole life. Um, I was out last night just in my local area um, where the local residents group there delivered over 200 food parcels. It wasn't these boxes, but 200. Um, and where they easily identified the community. They have been putting it out on social media, on leaflets, saying if there's anyone else, because people will fall through. You have the difficulty that people won't self-refer. So how do we get others within the community to refer somebody if they feel that there is a vulnerability there. And I think we have to be as flexible as we can to make sure that we're reaching as many people as we can. So it is about society as a whole playing their part in trying to identify those people and for that list to be centralised and then disseminated out um, amongst the 11 councils. And I have to say the role of the, the local authorities has been brilliant as well. And obviously they're under immense pressure um, in terms of lost income. Um, in terms of trying to redirect services and also keeping their staff safe. Um, but they've really went above and beyond to work with the department and connect into local communities to ensure that we do reach those people. So it's a work in progress. If you have other ideas, um, we're more than interested um, to listen to you. But it will develop over the coming weeks. Um, and the more people that we can include, the better. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and also thank you to the Minister for her statement. Uh, I know the House and the Minister will join with me in offering the prayers of this House and our condolences to the families of the 82 people who have sadly uh, died as a result of this dreadful virus, and also sending our thoughts and prayers to the many, fam many families out there who are impacted directly with a loved one uh, who is uh, battling this awful disease. I also would join the Minister in uh, commending the tremendous work of the frontline key workers within her department. They have certainly uh, stepped up way beyond the call of duty uh, and have delivered uh, on a huge scale, given the demand on the department. I'm ministerially commended for your leadership in relation to that. But also, Minister, I think it's important in these times that we're in to recognise that out of all this uh, awfulness in terms of the virus, there's so much good that has come out in terms of our community. I've witnessed in first hand throughout West Tyrone the huge levels of kindness, generosity, sincerity, uh, and also the selflessness of our uh, communities, particularly when you consider businesses that open their doors, like the Red Pepper in Castle Derg, the Hidden Pearl, uh, the Straban Community Project, uh, Mark McDermott and Straban. Those four examples in a day deliver in excess of 1,500 meals to a wider area. That is an unbelievable uh, and generous contribution to vulnerable people in our society. And I want to put firm on, firmly on record the thanks of, our house to, to, of this House to everybody across the entirety uh, of Northern Ireland who are stepping up and doing a huge amount to support people. Minister, my, my uh, question is focused on uh, discretionary support. I know you have touched on it quite a bit today, and I thank you as well for the efforts around that and to the staff there. And I have no doubt they are inundated with queries. It's just that I have had some difficulty in, in that applications that were submitted two weeks ago have still not been processed or answered. Uh, and there may be a reason for that. Obvious uh, is that the demand is so significant. But I'm just wondering, Minister, what's been put in place there to make that a much more efficient system? And also, has there been a cap uh, on the amount that a person can claim, or is it unique to circumstances? And finally, how often can someone apply? So if they were to receive, say, £100 say, this week, can they apply again in a fortnight or whatever? But thank you, Minister, again for your work around this. It's appreciated.
No, thanks very much. And I suppose, like the other benefits, there's been a huge uptake in demand for discretionary support, and it had been under pressure. Um, we have uh, realigned our services and uh, realigned staff to go in and support that. The difficulty with discretionary support, it's a manual system, so you have to do it manually, um, and you have to be in work, so those working from home aren't able to do it. Um, and that did add a pressure a number of weeks ago, and uh, we're working through that and rectifying it. Um, I've obviously uh, changed the, the regulations. We brought in an additional measure under discretionary support that if you're impacted by COVID-19, you have to self-isolate. You can then also um, access discretionary support as well, and that it will be done through a grant. So it won't be a loan, it will be done through a grant. You can get that grant more than once. And obviously, that's about people who are in crisis. Um, we will respond to that crisis in the here and now, if that's access to food, if it's to pay essential bills, like your rent or electric or heat, um, they can get access to those discretionary um, support payments. I'm also bringing forward a change in regulations to lift the, the income threshold. Um, so at the minute, it's just over the 18,000. The benefit cap is 20,000. So I want to lift it above that benefit cap to ensure that more people um, can be brought in, and I'm hoping that that will be tabled um, in this chamber just after the Easter um, recess. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, I too wish to commend you and your department for the work and the commitment made to our most vulnerable citizens at this time. My question is on eligibility criteria and the publication of such to make it easier for people to apply to two funds. Firstly, would you be minded to publish the criteria by which your department awards grants in order to make it easier for people to make a successful application for the Universal Credit Contingency Fund? And secondly, would you be able to detail even further on the expanded eligibility, eligibility criteria for people to apply to the discretionary support fund? Yeah, thank you. Well, the discretionary support fund, obviously, the changes to that came through this assembly a couple of weeks ago. So that is anyone who has to self-isolate or has symptoms of COVID-19 um, and then has to stay within their home and are under pressure, financial pressure, um, they can ap apply for the grant through discretionary support. Uh, the information of that, we have streamlined all of the forms to try and make it as easy as possible, because even I get confused trying to navigate uh, the system. Um, and all of that information is now being put up and streamlined on, um, it, no, it's not Advice NI, sorry, it's NI Direct. Um, we're also working, obviously, the COVID community helpline number is being managed by Advice NI. So again, if you phone that helpline number or the Advice NI helpline number, um, they're working with a lot of the independent advice sector in uh, managing that phone line. And again, you can get support there um, in terms of going through or trying to navigate your way through the system. We are trying to look at uh, new communication that can be either in a leaflet or online, which really sets out the changes that the department has made, because obviously there's been a lot of changes and it is hard um, to keep up. The committee had even raised this um, at the committee at the start of this week. So we're trying to find a way. Uh, we're working on that at the moment to have that streamlined to ensure um, that that can go out um, also. Um, and then the issue of universal credit, I'll have a look at that. I'm not sure I would have um, assumed that it would have been there in terms of the eligibility criteria. So I'll take that back and come back to you on that. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thanks uh, to the Minister for the statement. Uh, I want to ask a question in relation to renters in this crisis. Um, all renters, including low paid workers, the unemployed, students, and everyone else. Because it seems to me a lot has been done for landlords, but not enough uh, for tenants. And the bigger question really is how can we, how can we have a situation where low paid people, uh, vulnerable people, uh, are able to afford to keep a roof over their heads? And I am concerned that not enough uh, is being done to support them. For example, Landlords can avail of a three month mortgage holiday, yet there are no uh, provisions in place to prevent a suspension of rents uh, which exist in other uh, European countries. And th in this context, therefore, landlords might actually be able to make money out of the situation because they can avail of a mortgage holiday while uh, extracting rents uh, throughout this crisis. To me, that seems bizarre. Uh, and thousands are obviously losing their jobs, uh, others have reduction in wages, and many are struggling. 
Uh, my view is that there should be an immediate rent suspension for those impacted by this, and I believe the Minister, the Executive and the Westminster Government should be doing everything in their power uh, to uh, achieve this. So I want to ask the Minister uh, on that. And if I can quickly, Mr Speaker, because we're under time, uh, can I quickly ask the Minister uh, on the benefit cap? Um, I believe the benefit cap should be scrapped uh, immediately. It was always wrong and unjust, uh, and it should have no place uh, in this crisis. And many workers are obviously going over and uh, doing more hours uh, to ensure our shelves are stacked, uh, stocked uh, with services. Um, so does the Minister agree that the benefit cap uh, should be replaced, and do you have any plans uh, uh, to, to scrap it? Thanks for your kind comments, um, Jerry. Uh, I suppose the first thing is around um, renters. I mean, I live in a, a working class community um, in South Belfast. I know the impact that this is having on working people um, and on working class communities as well. And obviously, there has been a variety of changes that have been introduced um, within my department in terms of trying to protect those most vulnerable. Um, those within the private rented sector, but also those in the social sector that are also paying rents. Uh, we have got an agreement uh, with uh, housing associations and with the housing executive that no one will be evicted from their home because they can't keep up payments. I think the important thing is, is when you're looking at the payment increase, over 70 per cent in terms of the income from the housing executive comes through um, housing benefit. And it's important that those payments continue through the social security system into the housing executive, because you will know yourself and you've raised it on previous occasions um, that uh, the housing executive is under critical pressure. We have to make sure that we can maintain our stock at the end of this and particularly maintain the stock for those who need it the most, those working class communities that are vulnerable. And so therefore we need those housing benefit payments to continue to flow throughout this crisis and beyond this crisis as well. But what I have done is suspended the, the rental increase then, um, and that's at a cost of 4.5 million for the next six months. So I have put that on hold, and obviously then that's money that can't be used to go into um, upgrading the stock. So these are the difficulties and the challenges then um, that we face. The other areas then that we have looked at, I don't have the power in terms of instructing that rent isn't paid within the private rented sector. That doesn't. Some of that legislation rests with Westminster, and I don't have the power um, around that. What I have done is I'm introducing legislation here. It's going to come on the floor of the House. I think it's due on the 21st of April, and that is about extending the notice to quit to ensure that no one, as a result of COVID-19, is going to be evicted from their home. I'm also issuing uh, clear guidance uh, to landlords this week, and I reported this at the committee um, at the start of this week, um, that says clearly to landlords that if they do get um, the three-month holiday, that that should be passed on to the tenant. I will also be issuing clear guidance around the process that landlords must follow in engaging with their tenants and given a reasonable time in terms of uh, their financial situation so that if anything goes to court, the court um, can see clearly what the department's guidance is and that they can take that into account. And again, we're also engaging with the court service um, around that as well. We have also, in terms of the um, housing payments, um, the local housing allowance, that has been increased um, as a result of changes where 100 per cent of that payment is now going to be paid and that that's going to be covered over the 13 weeks. And again, I'm looking to see the discretionary support housing payments. Can I um, extend that and change or increase the criteria? To allow more people to come into that. The discretionary support um, allowance through the normal social security system, again, if people are in crisis because they have to self-isolate, can apply for that grant under the COVID-19 uh, discretionary support for housing as well. Um, they can do that also. And again, we're looking at more. I mean, I know an issue is in the private rented sector, obviously, um, I'm trying to address these. We can only take it step by step. So we are looking at it. Um, I know students have been um, adversely impacted, and again, we're looking to see what further changes we can make. And if I can bring changes in, I will do it. I mean, there, there's no problem there whatsoever. Again, if people have suggestions and if it's within my remit or my power to do, 
I will definitely do it. Again, we're engaging with the, the National Union of Students. I was seeing the tweet at me on that today again as well. So we're proactively trying to look at everything that we can. Um, we're moving firstly on the eviction stuff because obviously it needs a legislative change. It has to have royal assent. But that will be heard here on the floor of this House on the 21st of April. Um, and we'll continue to move on um, around other areas of housing. I suppose the other issue is around homelessness, as I touched on as well. We've done a lot of work around the issue of homelessness, and I am glad to report, because of the amazing work by those at the coalface, the housing executive, that we haven't had any rough sleepers, those who have had no choice um, but to be on the streets in the last two weeks in Belfast and Derry. And again, I think that has been really, really good in terms of how people have worked together, and I have to commend those uh, working at, at a community level and within that sector for the amazing work that they've been doing. And we're committed to be um, extending that out over the coming period. Thank you, Minister. As was noted by Mr. Carroll, we have about four and a half minutes left. In yesterday's, um, or I'm sorry, in beg pardon, in Tuesday's meeting of this committee, I did say that if there was time left over, I would allow if members had any burning questions remaining that they wanted to ask if members wanted to rise in their place. Mr Given. Thank you, Principal Speaker. One of the issues brought to my attention is the pressure being put on local government and councils across Northern Ireland. Um, they have triggered their emergency uh, planning uh, mechanisms, but they are also facing significant financial implications as a result of this. Uh, what support is the Minister's Department able to provide? The emergency financial assistance I wrote to local councils at the start of this week. So that is, if you're responding to a crisis, normally this would have happened in flooding incidents, um, that my department will cover the emergency costs associated with that, if that's increased staff costs. So we have initiated that as part of this public health emergency. Um, obviously, we have had the community support fund filter via the local councils, and we're working with them on the food boxes. We know, as I touched on earlier, that there is a loss of income for councils. Um, and obviously that's a huge loss of income and we're in the middle of compiling what that's going to look like in the time ahead. Uh, we are looking to make a financial bid um, to the Minister of Finance. Um, but at this point, obviously, the initial bids coming through finance are to deal with the emergency in the here and now in terms of trying to save lives, protecting those who are most vulnerable, making sure that we get food supplies. But I'm acutely aware of the impact that this is having on councils. Um, and we are making those financial bids in terms of um, the loss of income, because obviously that income is used for essential services within the council areas. So we're working with local government and with Solus on that, and then that will be presented um, to the Minister of Finance and ultimately to the Executive. Uh, the Minister over this last 50 odd minutes or so has outlined a range of initiatives and interventions her department has made in a very short period of time to protect. Uh, people at this time. And I know she did say in one of her answers that she was going to, or her department, were collating the information around that number of initiatives. Uh, has she or could she provide the Assembly with a, a figure in terms of the financial contribution her department has made over this last period of time towards protecting the most vulnerable in our society? I don't have that at the minute, um, but I can get it for you in terms of the changes, um, which will include the bid that we put in that we got yesterday um, around homelessness services and others. But it goes into the tens of millions. And then if you look at benefit support, um, you're probably going way above that. But I can get that information and share it with members. Ms. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I would earlier I didn't get the chance to do this. Um, I'm sure you have seen on Facebook and on different social media, we have a number of volunteers who have together come you know, to do the food bank. You talked about it earlier. Um, but they aren't in organisations. They are simply good-willed people who are coming together for the needs of their community. Could I perhaps ask that when we take learning from this, that we consider how we can help those people who are using their own cars, their own fuel, um, to go out and deliver prescriptions and groceries to people's homes, who out of the kindness of their hearts have come together um, in this crisis and have really shown how wonderful the Northern Ireland community is? Yeah, no, 100 per cent. I mean, the amount of goodwill has been amazing. And as you say, it's not always in structured groups, albeit I would encourage them to get involved in activism in that way. But um, 
Uh, it's been amazing whether that's been a neighbour or somebody in the street looking after somebody else or identifying or just having a chat or a phone call. Um, it's been absolutely amazing. I suppose the important thing that if people are um, out and they're using petrol or whatever, um, go and speak to the local council because part of the community support fund, which is going through the local councils, is around those types of issues. It's trying to support grassroots um, work during this crisis to ensure that we're responding to those needs. So nobody should be out of pocket, especially if you're volunteering. Um, and I would encourage them then to speak to the councils. And as I say, we're going to be looking at that fund. Um, I've agreed that I will review it in the next six weeks to ensure um, is it fit for purpose? Um, do we need to look at an additional resource around that um, in the time ahead? But I would ask them, they may not want to, but you know, if, if the local council can even pick that up through the community support fund. Um, and I think, yeah, a day of recognition. I mean, it's probably for a lot of people across society. Um, I suppose the bigger thing for me is, are things going to change in society in the time ahead in terms of our economic system? And will that protect the most vulnerable? Will it um, look at those frontline workers that are often the lowest paid? Um, and if that is the thing that can change after this, um, then maybe there is some good coming out of this emergency. What my colleague uh, Kelly Armstrong has said, we have seen some of the best in our community groups. I look at my own constituency, John Lawson of Head of the Road Bar and Restaurant, providing meals to people in rural communities that are isolated. I think of Phyllis Abraham and uh, Aden Dairy Community Group. These are doing fantastic work. Minister, is there any way in which we can help these organisations to target potentially people that may be missed uh, in this epidemic? And I'm particularly focused maybe now on people in our rural communities who actually don't go and seek help, but are living now in isolation and in many cases, very elderly people as well, and on their own. No, I think 100%, and you're right. I mean, you've seen a lot of chefs, people who are out of work and aren't getting the income, that are actually now out volunteering. They're turning their kitchens into community hubs um, and making sure that they're providing hot meals. We're obviously working with the Nye Project, but also with chefs across the north to see. So we're obviously doing the free school meals. There's the food boxes. There's the money that's going out through councils, and um, organisations are doing this themselves as well around food parcels. We are looking to see, because not every older person maybe cooks. Do you know they maybe don't get, and maybe that one hot meal a day. So we are trying to see how we can work with um, local uh, restaurants. Um, local chefs um, and even uh, social enterprises that do food preparation and can we provide a hot meal or a ready uh, made meal service. Um, so again, link in, tell them to contact the department and we can link them in. The other thing again as well is the community um, COVID community fund that I have announced yesterday that's gone through the councils. That money can be used within the local council area. So the kind of priorities for that um, is around food. So making sure that people have access to food. So if that's linking in and working in partnership with local restaurants, then that's good if it's meeting the need. It's also around financial security. So are there things, I mean, I, I know again in Belfast I'm using because that's where I live. You know, they're buying like gas cards, they're doing top-ups, they're doing um, to make sure that people have the essentials. So some of the money's being used for that. Um, and the other issue then is connectivity, and particularly for rural areas, border communities as well. And as I said, I am looking to the Community Support Fund. That funding is mainly disseminated on the basis of objective need and population size. So the likes of Belfast and others will get a, an increased amount. So I'm recognising that there's a gap in rural areas um, in terms of rural poverty, and particularly in areas and border uh, communities as well. So I'm looking to see if I can add an additional fund in the time ahead um, that will support those local areas, um, and I'll be announcing that in the short term as well. Thank you for your indulgence today. Um, very quickly. Um, Minister, the food box scheme. There's been some significant concern raised with me through community organisations about who makes the decision of who can uh, get a box. Um, and there's some confusion just with the councils. Um, and there's no, uh, as you say earlier on, there's no definitive list yet. But who would be making that decision? Would it be the trust, the GP? Is it the referral? Is it the council? And if there isn't any guidance, can that be issued? Yeah, well, the, the guidance is, and again, I'll just go back to local councils to ensure that that's filtering out. 
The guidance is for anyone, firstly, who is shielding. So for the next three months, they have got a letter from their GP and has to shield. It is not for all of those, because that is 40,000 people, but it is identifying out of those people who does not have um, support networks. So if they are within their home for the next three months, they do not have somebody that can go and get them food. They maybe do not have the financial wherewithal to get the food. The boxes should be targeted at them. But we wanted to go beyond that. So in England, that is how the scheme is working. But I recognise that there is food poverty out there anyway, um, let alone um, in the midst of this public health emergency. So I want to get these boxes to as many people as we can. And therefore, in some ways, the scheme has to be flexible. Uh, we do have to get, and that is why I want to work with local councils and work with local community organisations, because they are better placed than I am. Even when you look at a health trust list and you look at vulnerable people that may be on that list, there's a lot of people out in the community that aren't on that list, but they're vulnerable. And therefore, we need to use as many mechanisms as we can um, to do that. So at the minute, we're on 10,400 parcels. We can grow that if we need to grow that further. And I'm sure the executive would be supportive. Um, we have 10 million in the budget at the moment that if there was a need to look at more, then we could do that again. But I'll make sure that the, the guidance that is there um, is reissued to local councils. Um, but it is important that we shouldn't limit it. If somebody is in need um, of a food box and they're saying that they have no other support or no other financial means to get that food, then they should receive a box. Thank you, Minister. Agenda item five is the time, date and place of the next meeting. We have received confirmation from the Health Minister that he wishes to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at a meeting to be held on the afternoon of Wednesday, the 15th of April. We have also received confirmation from the Infrastructure Minister that she wishes to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee on the afternoon of Thursday, the 16th of April. Formal notification to members will be issued this afternoon by the Speaker's Office. That concludes this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Stay safe and God bless.